and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, gang? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you for the next couple hours. And it uh, should be a fun one. Lots to get to coming out of last night's one nothing overtime loss in Toronto against the, uh, against the Leafs. Um, and looking forward to uh, getting the reaction from Toronto with um, one of the best around, Brian Hayes, the host of TSN's Overdrive. Hazy B himself is going to join us coming up on the program. We'll also look forward to uh, Brandon Rowicki stopping by and Scott Billick as well. We'll get to the Cool Bet lines a little later on. Um, but, of course, it is Leafs week here on WST. Game last night, rematch in Winnipeg on Saturday. Um, you know, Couldn't really... Not much to pick apart about the... Uh, performance in the effort of the Winnipeg Jets last night. They just couldn't score a damn goal. Um, and that will happen when your number one center's out, and then you play almost the entire game without your number one defenseman as well. Um, but anyways, we'll uh, dive into that in a minute. Uh, reaction from last night's game, as well as some other interesting news around the National Hockey League. Um, and then look forward to welcoming in our guests, Brandon, Brian Hayes, and Scott Billick of the Winnipeg Sun. Listen, just before we get into it, welcome to everybody in chat. Hit that like button if you haven't already on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And a big shout out to the podcast listeners who are uh, making Winnipeg Sports Talk a part of your day. Of course, we can't do it without the great support of our sponsors, including Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Aikens Lake, Sport Manitoba, Manitoba Liquor Marts, uh, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Little Brown Jug, F Apparel, Wallace and Wallace, the Winnipeg Jets, Modern Man Barbershop, Manitoba Battery, Canadian Club, and of course we'll get to a why not question of the day for not Autocorp over at Waverly and McGilvery. Michael Remus, what's going on? Feeling good, Huss. You know, even though the Jets, well, you know, my mood is dependent on how the Jets play, of course, but um, even though uh, I'm feeling good, first of all, the weather is great. I mean, go outside and not feel oh. like I'm going to die. So that's good. Like not so, you know, anal about having gloves on, you know, I'm not going to have my skin freeze, but um, as far as the jets and how I'm feeling, I mean, I did not have good expectations. I was worried about the, uh, Me neither. about the goal streak, you know, in terms of 34 straight games of three or less uh, on a goalie. And now it's 35 with a uh, pretty impressive defensive effort, uh, offensive effort too. But you know, we talked so much about how the Leafs were poor, didn't have defensive structure, and how they didn't get goaltending. And they certainly got it yesterday from Ilya Samsonov. In fact, I watched the game on Sports and I, I wasn't sure if the Jets had a goalie. And then, because the only goalie I kept hearing about uh, was Samsonov, but Brossois played well, did what he needed to do. And so I'm feeling pretty good, actually, knowing that, okay, even though they had a couple injuries, they're able to withstand and, and play pretty well against a good Toronto team. Yeah, I mean, I, I see, um, uh, who was it, um, who just popped that number in the chat? I think it was, uh, maybe it was Ben Dover, um, who said, uh, yeah, lack of depth, Huss. I mean, I don't know, I'll push back on that. I I mean, I think it speaks to the depth that the team has, that they're without Velarde and without Shifley, um, and controlled the game as much as they did, as well as their commitment to the defensive structure um, and the effort that the team put forth. I mean, listen, I mean, is it depth that they weren't able to beat Samson off with everything that they generated? I mean, I guess you could call it elite or scoring depth, maybe. Um, but listen, when you're undermanned, I mean, you got to find ways to stay in games and give yourself a chance. And the, certainly the Jets had a chance. Obviously, they got a point. I would have been far more choked if this was a uh, regulation loss as opposed to an OT loss. Um, but overall, I mean, I... 
listen, you know, you you play that same game 10 times, a few of them are going to go in. A lot more on the Samsonov than was on Loren Brassois, who played great, made some big saves in the third period, but for the most part didn't really, um, certainly didn't have the sort of work that his opponent did on the other side of the net. I mean, we'll get into this with Scott later on, but here's a tweet from him at the end of last night, and I totally concur with him. For those suggesting the Jets didn't dominate the game, here are the numbers. Shot attempts, 59-34 Jets. Scoring chances, 23-8 Jets. Grade A chances, 9-2 Jets. And expected goals, 2.23 to one to 0.84 for Winnipeg. I mean, that was a great defensive game by Winnipeg. You got to score a goal. They didn't. Um, you would have really liked to at least made a bit more of that four-on-three power play in overtime right now, Reem. But uh, I think we all agree the Jets are offensively challenged right now in their current construction without Shifley and Velarde. And I think there's certainly room to add a little bit more. That's a big topic that we'll be getting at as we get closer to the trade deadline. Um, but in the many different ways the team could, quote-unquote, lose, doing it in overtime in a performance like that, as undermanned as they were, I don't think very many Jet fans are, um, you know, too bent about the way the team played last night as much as you probably would have liked and thought that the team deserved a better result. I would agree. Again, I thought um, Austin Matthews was going to score, you know, well, he did score one. I thought he'd score at least one in regulation time. And look, you look at the game, they're out with Shifley, your number one center. You're out Velarde, who's, you can make an argument who your top winger is. He's a you know, top line winger. You're missing your top number one defenseman. He gets, you know, injured. And you're missing your top goalie in Hellebuck. Brossois played excellent. Uh, you know, the first period was phenomenal. And look, if Lowry and Barron score on that 2 on 0, which huh. I, I mean, I mean, you want to be like, oh, you guys got too cute there, but they nailed it. They did the back they and got forth. Two quality shots La on it. Lowry got a shot point blank. Barron, you thought, oh no, he's gonna miss the rebound. He got a stick on it. Samsonov raised his pad, and uh, you know Brossois mentioned after the game put, got, really got the crowd in. Where they're on their feet, they hadn't seen uh, goaltending like that all season. Uh, he certainly stepped up. Uh, the penalty kill got put to work. Uh, so I thought, uh, no, no, never mind. I, they got put to work. And what was it here? They had a number of chances. And look, the Jets got power play at the end. Uh, shout out to the refs making some calls in favor of the Jets. They had uh, what? Power, you know, they could have taken the lead, but the power play in big spots this year hasn't come up with it. I don't want to say special teams was the difference because it certainly uh, helped the Jets. You know, Toronto 0 for 5 on the power play. The Jets going 0 for 2. But the penalty kill is huge, but they need to get bailed out by the power play once in a while and wasn't there. I don't know. 1 0 loss. I mean, you got to score a win. They didn't score, had chances, and didn't convert. I, you got to be happy with the effort. Missing, you know what I missing was thinking about last night? Remember when we were talking of, uh, to Ken yesterday and I'm, we were talking about the lines? And I'm like, you know, we need to, you know, they need to figure out a way to score. And I think I famously said yesterday in the program, well, Ken, you can't win a game 0 0. Well, they almost did that yesterday, literally 0 0 through 60 minutes. Um, and I would have felt, I would have felt fine going to a shootout last night, trying to get that extra point the way LB was playing. Um, but again, Samsonov was on one as well last night. But I mean, every metric had the Jets the far better team. It doesn't always work out that way. And over the course of an 82-game schedule, especially when you're missing a couple of your top offensive players, and particularly um, the linchpin of your offense in your number one center, There'll probably be a couple games over the course of the year where the goals dried up. And listen, they've dried up over the last couple games against Boston and Toronto. The bigger concern out of last night's game, Remo, is the condition of one Josh Morrissey, who played 7-17 in the first period and then left the game. Listen to these ice time minutes for the Jets' blue line. Dylan DeMello, 25-43. Brendan Dillon, 25-30. Neil Pionk, 26-50. Dylan Sandberg, 20-48. And Nate Schmidt, 13, or sorry, 18-36. Every one of those players really needed to step up. And 
I, I can't say enough about the defense, the defensemen of the Winnipeg Jets playing shorthanded without a guy that usually eats 25 minutes a night the way they stepped up. And, you know, we heard from Rick Bonus, and we'll hear a little bit before afterwards. I mean, like he had nothing but good things to say about the way the team played, would have liked one to go in. But if you are doing an autopsy of the winning goal, um, it was not on one of the defensemen. Frankly, it was probably Nikolai Ehlers that, uh, you know, let um, Austin Matthews uh, get a little loose and then score that goal at the end. So, um, <laughs> you know, you'd like to win them all. The Jets have kind of spoiled, I think, fans with uh, what they've done so far this year. Unfortunately, once in a while, games like that are going to happen. And um, right now, you just hope that they can get some reinforcements back and as I mentioned, Remo, you just hope that Josh Morrissey isn't out long term. Um, let's just say that there was plenty of memories of a certain incident with former captain Blake Wheeler that were running through people's uh, uh, heads last night as it uh, it did look like Josh Morrissey paid, uh, what did you refer to it as? Yeah, the, the ultimate, ultimate price. The ultimate sacrifice ultimate that Josh sacrifice. Morrissey made for the Winnipeg Jets. Blake Wheeler, it's crazy because, you know, that kind of play – doesn't happen every year where maybe you get hit, but like be out injured, like a, like back to back seasons where one of your top players like gets hit in the balls of the puck and you're out. So hopefully it's not long term. And someone said in chat, Jamie Thomas was on Jets at noon and confirmed that he got hit. Oh, here it is. Dino says he was just on CGOB Jets at noon and confirmed 44 took a puck in the gentleman's. Area. I mean, we can come up with whatever. Yeah, I could have confirmed that too for you. We all watched the well, game and saw where well, he got taken. Well, we needed the confir confirmation. <laughs> I don't know from the official. Like, what are they going to put in the injury notes? Low. I guess they'll just write lower, lower body. But yeah, we needed the confirmation, and hopefully, it's not long term. I don't know. That's that sucks. Like, that's really. I don't think it's a sports hernia, Rennie. Um, <laughs> Look, that's maybe, why maybe we I should, maybe we should and clarify. <laughs> and Sean Reynolds talked about being hit in the stomach for like ten minutes. So <laughs> sorry, Randy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, th is that, that's what it was, and uh, that's terrible. And look, you're out your top center, out your top D as well. And look, maybe they make a call. Does Vili Hainala get called up to play power play? Do they put in Stan or Declan Chisholm, who've been sitting on the sidelines for a long time? And thankfully, this player break's coming up, and you get an extra like week or so. So that is definitely a, a big story. But I, I think the story, you know, Brossois continues to play great. Obviously, the def, you know, and the team defense was great, but scoring uh, a concern. So we'll see. And on that overtime goal, I think Ehlers lost his stick, kind of sent things out of whack, and you know, they tried making the stretch pass through the middle when there was a guy there. I mean, it's three on three. You have the whole ice, and you're trying to jam it through a guy. Up the middle, maybe not the play. And yeah, he was slow covering Matthews. Um, there's, do you want me to keep going here or do you have anything? I was going to. Well, I mean, just to, uh, to close up the, uh, the Josh talk. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, that is a, uh, it is a sensitive area. It is a sensitive place for any man. And um, I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, it's sometimes people make cracks because, you know, it's the oldest thing, you know, in the book, you know, getting hit in the junk, but I mean, mm -hmm. there is the possibility of that that could be serious. So, mm -hmm. I mean, just hoping that, you know, he, I, listen, I, look, best case scenario, you know, he was out for the night and he's back on Saturday. I mean, we'll get an update later on this week. I don't think that will be the case. Um, but to your point, Remo, I mean, I think what's most interesting coming out of all of that is if Morrissey is out for the game on Saturday, heading into the player break. I think everything, we'll see how things go after that. I mean, unless there's some really bad news and we find out that he'll be out for an extended period of time, which is a big issue for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, who goes in? Perfect why not question of the day for not autocorp at Waverly and McGilvery. I mean, do you put in Big Stan? Do you put in Declan Chisholm, who've been with the club but haven't played since early in December? Or Vili Hainala, who by all accounts made the team in, you know, in training camp, who actually has been playing for the last couple of weeks with the Manitoba Moose. Is he that guy that comes up and uh, and gets on? Um, you know, a lot of decisions for uh, for the Winnipeg Jets right now, but interested to hear what um, what everyone folks, uh, what everyone thinks uh, in the uh, in the chat. And big a big hitter says, yeah, all kidding aside, it's not funny. You can literally die from something like that. So uh Thoughts are with Josh Morrissey right now. 
Um, and he's such an important player. I mean, you can make an argument. Hellebuck's the MVP. Shifley's the MVP. You can certainly make an argument of this team. Josh Morris, he's right in that mix as well. And if he's out for an extended period of time, or even just a game on Saturday, everyone, like the defense did last night against Toronto, everyone is going to need to step up in a big way. Yeah, I think you could make an argument at each of them because I don't think they're replaceable at their at their position. You know, uh, Brossois played great for Hellbuck, but he's been their guy. Morrissey, clear number one D. Shafley, clear number one center. They're all, uh, you know, pretty important in the team's success. And if you wanted forensic analysis, I did enjoy Ken on Kenny and Randy, Ken Weeb saying, but Blake Wheeler had to be helped off the ice and Josh Morrissey was able to get off the ice on his own, like make that way you will. And... We're all reminded of Blake Wheeler's quote saying, well, I already had, uh, you know, two, I'm not having any more kids was his line. And Josh Morrissey, I don't know if he has any other kids, so hopefully uh, he's, he's okay. Well, moving on from that, I was, you know, with, the, with this overtime hus, I was kind of surprised that Cole Perfetti, you know, with the missing Shafley, missing Velarde, that this guy can't get on an overtime. I mean, is there any other team in the league where your fourth leading scorer doesn't see the ice in, in three-on-three overtime? You're having... You know, Ehlers got a couple shifts. Uh, Nita Ryder gets on. Appleton's getting a turn. Lowry's getting two shifts. I don't know. I think you can make room to put Cole Perfetti. You got to score goals, and he's your fourth leading scorer. I think he deserves deserves, deserves a shot. And you know, maybe you look at him and you think, oh, he's not the fastest skater or he's not the biggest guy. But uh, he's shown time and time again he can produce. And you don't know if he can or can't do it until you put him on the ice. So that's... You know, I'll, I'll weigh in on Perfetti yeah, getting some ice time. On that. I have a theory on that. I think that they are worried that Cole would get exposed in three-on-three three, mm. um, with his speed, which, you know, is not there, you know, with the likes of Connor and Ehlers. Although he makes it work. I mean, he certainly does make it work, but maybe that would be more of a challenge. Um, and, and I think that they are also worried about winning the winning of puck battles and what happens when the other team gets the puck? Um, like the thing with Niederreiter and Lowry and Appleton is that they're all pretty effective when the team doesn't have the puck in trying to minimize those scoring chances as well as winning those puck battles. And I do think the coaches maybe don't have the confidence that Cole's the best guy to have it when you when you don't. Now, if you have possession and maybe pull throw a guy over the boards and get him on. And, I, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, yeah. would, I, would I put Perfetti on for a couple for sure? I'm just trying to give maybe some context as I'm, to what the fears are of the coaches and why they maybe don't think he's the guy in three on three. I'm here to, I am can hear the other side, but again, he's fourth leading scorer. You got to score. They scored zero goals. So I'd like to see him at least get a shot. I mean, you think missing your top two guy or, or two of your top guys in Shifley and Connor, there'd be room, but. There wasn't, and I don't know, and they didn't end up winning. Ehlers, I mean, could have had back-to-back games here, not back-to-back overtimes with a highlight reel goal. I mean, what a move he had with the toe drag and a shot on Samsonov, who, you know, we spent all the last two days, how they don't have a goalie, how, you know, they haven't been able to figure this out. And, I mean, what a performance. He said after the game, he was in tears with the Sammy, Sammy chance. It's, um, it's pretty incredible, that, that yeah. game yesterday. Yeah, listen, Samsonov was brilliant. I mean, he, um, I mean, the Jets made him earn that one. And, mm -hmm. you know, are maybe a few of those chances different if it's Shifley or Velarde in the mix? Yeah, probably. Um, but listen, you got to play with the guys that you have, and they were already shorthanded. And then they got even more shorthanded when um, when Josh Morrissey was uh, was out of the game. Let's hear what Bones had to say. Um, first off, the first question, how's Josh Morrissey uh, and what Bones had to say about his team's performance last night? Josh Morrissey. Uh, lower body will be reevaluated. Okay. Uh, from that block shot. Uh, yeah. Nice, right? How do you think your defense handled the... Really well. I thought that those, and that's by far the best road game, or best game of the road trip. We played really, really well, and they give the five guys a lot of credit, but and our forwards did a great job supporting them, back checking, back pressuring, getting the puck out of the four, their their hands. So uh, it was a great team effort to defensively tonight. We we didn't give up very much five on five, and uh, when we you know the few chances we gave up, LB made some good saves. But again, that's the best trip, uh, 
the best game of the road trip. Yeah, challenge you guys to be faster. How impressed were you by the way they played in the first period? Really well. That's you know again we were we, we broke the puck out a lot quicker, and we were we were on top of them. We had lots of good chances. Give their goalie a ton of credit tonight. He made a lot of big saves. He made a lot of timely saves. Uh, but I really liked our first period. That's one of the best first periods of the year. Yeah, and that first period that Rick mentioned was um, was all Jets. I mean, pretty much the entire 20 minutes, Winnipeg pushing the situation. Um, 16 to 4 was the shots in that first period. Um, here's a little bit more from Bones on how his team and the blue line responded after losing Josh Morrissey in the first. Well, you, again, when you lose your defense early like that, you, you've got to rely on your forwards to help the defense out an awful lot. He's, he's obviously our most highly skilled defenseman, and it's a, it's a hole back there, but you have to play through injuries in this league, and uh, our team did a great job of that tonight. How do you describe your penalty kill, and do you feel like that disrupted the flow of those? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, again, we're, we're playing great, and all of a sudden we're taking three penalties in the second, and we lost our flow, and again, you got guys sitting on the bench too long, uh, so that was disappointing. Uh, we, we we talked before the game was stay out of the box. We ended up taking five, which is too many, and that, uh, that that had an effect on our offensive side of the puck as well because we're killing penalties so often, and the uh, the offensive guys are sitting on the bench. But again, it was a great team effort tonight. So we play like that on Saturday. Uh, I like our chances. What did you see on the winners? Kind of an unlucky bounce for you. No, we we lost coverage. <laughs> we were there. We 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 let the guy with 38 goals get behind us. We were there. We just lost coverage. All right, so there's Bones loving the performance of his team, um, especially stepping up after losing Josh Morrissey. And uh, listen, we got to hear a quick one from Loren Brassois, who was brilliant last night. I know the story of the game was Samsonov, considering his ups and downs this season. Brassois continued his brilliant play that we've seen over the last couple of months and definitely deserved a better fate as well. Here's Brassois on a game, but also the lack of work in the first period as the Jets were living in the Leafs' end. Uh, you know, it's... Something you got to get used to. Uh, it's not my first time, you know, especially on this team this year, going through a first period without a lot of shots because we're playing so well. So, um, you know, I've had I've seen it before this year and it wasn't a problem. What did you see on the winner? Um, I thought I was there. It looked like he double clutched it or missed it, went off his own body, and then up and over. Uh, but I'll have to look at the replay. What impressed you most about the way your decor handled things after Josh left? I mean, there were. I mean, I, I'm almost not impressed because I see it so consistently. Um, you know, especially from the forwards to, with the amount of back pressure that they give, uh, they give us. The, the D can be confident and um, and keep a good gap, and it's something we see every game. Now. How much flow do you think was taken out of the game in the second period when all the penalties started happening? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to see that, but at the same time, it almost gave us a boost by the third, uh, you know, just because we killed so many penalties, and it almost turned uh, into our, our momentum. All right, there's LB last night who did not get the win, took the OT loss, but um, was uh, was full marks for his play, although uh, maybe just one shot uh, behind Ilya Samsonov, who um, stole the show last night, and a win in two points for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, we'll talk about it coming up with Brandon Rewicki in just a minute. Brian Hayes, the host of TSN's Overdrive, coming up as well. And Scott Billick a little later on. Um, Got to give a big thanks to our friends at Canadian Club. Don't forget Winnipeg Whiskey Festival coming up. We'll have details on a special event next week for you WSTers. Um, pop by your local Manitoba Liquor Marts and get Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey and official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The original, the 100% rye, the Canadian classic 12-year-old, and still limited quantities of the limited release 15-year-old Sherry Cask, which is the CC 15-year-old, the signature 12-year-old whiskey finished with a secondary aging and Oloroso Sherry Casks. All the hallmarks of classic Canadian club with the added richness and sweetness of Sherry. And remember, folks, always enjoy responsibly. A um, little bit nicer outside right now, but that doesn't mean that uh, you got to make sure that your battery is good to go for both your car, your truck, um, or maybe gadgets that might help you out on the uh, ice, doing some ice fishing coming up. Manitoba Battery has batteries for literally everything at the best prices in town, beating the pants off the big box stores. And any purchase over 60 bucks, Donnie and the gang will deliver it to you for free. Don't forget, next month, a new Manitoba battery location opening in the south end of the city on Dover Court. Stay tuned for grand 
opening specials and sale information next month here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And for all your battery needs, manitobabattery.com, 204-783-8787. And if you don't want to pop by and see them, check them out in person at 1026 Logan Avenue. And uh, I've got a few nice comments on my haircut. Shout out to Cordell over at Modern Man Pemina. Of course, uh, guys, if you do need a little helmet reduction or, uh, frankly, much more, Modern Man has you covered. Conveniently located throughout the city with eight locations, including the new locations on Pemina Highway or Plessy Road. Uh, they've got you covered with great haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Make an appointment and book for you book your look via modernmanbarber.com. And give him a follow on Instagram over at Modern Man Barbershops. All right, let's bring in the host of Skates and Plates, Brandon Rowicki, for his weekly visit on WST. Rue, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are things going over there? Well, not too bad. I mean, honestly, if the Jets had managed to win that game last night with their backup goalie in, without Shifley, without Filardi, and losing Morrissey for the majority of the game... I probably would have come on and said this was one of the most impressive wins of the entire season. The only thing that was missing was an actual goal to get that win. But um, pretty hard to nitpick the uh, effort and the what the Jets put forward last night against a Toronto team that, while certainly had their big guns in, was a step behind Winnipeg for most of the game. And And, you know, when you talk about compete level and battles and whatnot, I mean, the Jets were full marks. Sometimes in 82 games, you're just not going to be able to get one past a hot goalie. Yeah, I, I, I thought the story of the night was the hell's going on in Toronto right now. Because, I mean, that that was a game the Leafs should have cruised out to like a four zip. You know what I mean? Like deplete. I mean, you said it all there. Depleted all that. Morris, he goes out. I don't know, man. I, I feel like if that happens to a Colorado or a Vegas when, when they've got healthy bodies, like teams like that would just bury you. Because they, they take advantage, and it's just uh, something something's wrong with, with the Maple Leafs in a, in, a, in a big, big way. So it's funny because that's actually what stood out to me. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I, it's what the Jets have shown all year long. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. They have been extremely resilient. They really haven't veered all that much from the bone system. Like, they've done it to a T at an alarmingly consistent rate. Right? We haven't seen this team play – a structured game in a long, long time. So I, I'm honestly more surprised at the the lack of pushback from from the Maple Leafs in this one uh, compared to what the Winnipeg Jets did. I mean, Just I'm, I'm on that of- on that note, I mean, like Sheldon Keith looked like he was at wit's end, and I mean, when there were those close up shots of Marner and Matthews and Nylander sitting on the bench for two consecutive power plays. Um, you knew that he's playing one of the few cards that he still got in. I mean, he looked, uh, and justifiably so, irate because his team was getting absolutely worked by a roster that, I mean, with all due respect, not on the level with the top-end talent of Toronto, and they didn't have an answer for a good portion of that game. No, no. I mean, really the only guy that's brought it for them consistently, I mean, Nylander's been good. But I mean, Matthews is on pace for 70. So, I mean, obviously, he was the only one that was going to score for, for Toronto in that one. But I, I, they, they just seem so so lifeless. Like, they're like just, like, floating down a creek without a paddle. It's it's just so bizarre because they've been the team that's, at least in the regular season the past few years, you know, lighted up pretty consistently. And they, they just – it looks like something's just missing there. And they've – I mean, look, they've whiffed on pretty much every offseason move Trilithi made. And so maybe that's having a bit of an impact on it too. Um, but look, the, the, there's no easy nights when you're facing a Jets team. Like that's kind of the other part that that comes out of it for me. It's yeah, we may be missing guys, and and you know the the star power might not be what it is when everybody's healthy. But there, there's no gimmies. Like there's no freebies from us. And so so that was outstanding to see, especially with the the five rip power play advantage early on, uh, which didn't get uh, <laughs> rectified until late in the game. It was just like everything's going against the Winnipeg Jets, and they still find a way to grab a point. And I feel I I feel like I'm kind of waiting for the All Star break. I think fans are kind of you know this is the dog days of winter, waiting for that. And I think the Jets are too, just to get guys back healthy and ready to go. And even with all that, they still find a way to push a skilled Toronto team to extra time. So yeah, no no complaints whatsoever from me. 
you know, I, I can't say enough about the way the uh, the five defensemen that remained after Josh Morrissey stepped out played. And, and you know, Brassois, I think, you know, nailed it that, you know, he's frankly not surprised and a big credit goes to the way the forwards were getting in with their back pressure and being a part of it. Um, all that being said, you do not want to play for an extended period of time without Josh Morrissey. And we don't have any... We don't have any confirmation as to how long he's going to be out other than we uh, all know just by using our own eyes that looked pretty damn painful. And the fact that he didn't return to the game makes you wonder that, you know, wonder how long he'll be out. Let's assume that he doesn't play on Saturday. Um, I threw it out to the chat earlier. Interesting options between two guys that have been with the club doing everything that's been asked of them that haven't played that are there but haven't played in the game since early December. And then a guy that was going to be in that situation at the beginning of the year comes back from injury that actually has been playing over the last little bit. Uh, I do wonder what uh, management is thinking about a potential decision for a six blue liner on Saturday night in the rematch. Yeah. I, I'm just going to take a wild stab at this and guess that the chat is uh, pretty Billy friendly right now. Oh, just, yeah. a, just a wild guess for me on that. I, I, I don't know. If the the stand right. lobby was a little quiet today. Um, little, yeah. we, we did we did have a few people chiming in. The Chisholm probably should be the guy that would go in. He's been around. He's had a limited chance to show what he can do. Um, but especially when you're thinking about Morrissey and everything that he does and how much he plays. I mean, you'll have a guy like Pionk play more. Brendan Dillon's going to play more. Um, but Morrissey does everything for the Winnipeg Jets and yeah. um, no one's going to come in and just replace him. But you do have to kind of wonder the things that would be missing from your blue line. And I think a lot of those um, are reasons why Billy might be a guy that you have to do it. In addition, I guess if you put him on IR, knowing that he was going to be out a week, you could activate Billy without having to put anybody else on waivers or anything like that. Um, I'm fascinated to see how this uh, how this goes out. Listen, best case scenario, Josh is able to play on Saturday night, but if he's not, um, you know where they go. I think is going to be a very interesting topic tomorrow in practice, heading into Saturday's game. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the old like, what would you do, and what what do you think the Jets are going to do? Because they are, I, I think they're two different answers. I'll be I'll be flabbergasted if it's not Stanley or Chisholm. Um, I, I feel like they're going to put Stanley in. Um, and I imagine the top four is in, in some, co- probably Dylan and DeMello. And then Sandberg jumps up with Neil Pionk. The one thing that's going to get lost in all this, because all the talk's going to be about who replaces Josh Morrissey, which is fair if he's out. But the other thing that shouldn't get lost is that Dylan Sandberg deserves some, some pretty significant minutes. Like, I mean, he was... To me, he might have been the the guy that jumped off the page the most against Toronto. And maybe it's because we just haven't seen him get that elevated role just yet this season. But I, I, I love watching him play. I, I think he's a keeper. And I, you know, if, if if he ends up with 20 plus minutes a night against Toronto, I think that's an outstanding outcome, regardless of who comes in um for a potentially injured Morrissey. So I mean that that's always to me, there's a silver lining in this, and that Sandberg, you know, I think deservedly gets a look inside that top four there. But I mean, how, how can you disagree with the excitement level of potentially just, hey, Billy, you know, you want a chance? Here's a chance. You swap in for Morrissey. And let's let's go here. Is it completely fair to him? Probably not, because he's still. I'm get. I'm guessing getting his sea legs under him. But I mean, you do see, especially if it's just a one game thing. But I know contracts and like it, it might make it difficult to to make it a reality. But you see sometimes where, you know, a top line winger goes out and, hey, maybe the team calls up their their prize prospect from the AHL for a one game look. And you don't have to, you know, you don't have to mix and match all your different lines up. You just plug and play there. I like I I, I am pretty tempted by the the uh, the excitement and the allure of, of what that might look like there. I'm just not getting my hopes up is kind of the, the main thing. Yeah, I, I think because it's Morrissey, like if, if it's not going to be Villy. I think I actually might lean on the Chisholm side um, because, of course, he can. And when he was in, he was handling the number two power play. Stylistically, it makes more which, sense. Which, which might be important because, listen, full marks to Pionk. I thought he was awesome last night. He was hitting as well. He was really, really engaged. And Nate Schmidt, I thought, had a real strong game. I mean, everyone on that jet blue line. I mean, they didn't give up a goal. And they carried the play. They limited chances. I mean, all the things that we've talked about, they did a great job. 
But I do think that Declan, with what he has in his toolbox, might be more of a fit for some of the holes. I mean, like what's Logan Stanley going to do other than go in, play third pairing minutes, maybe get out in the PK a little bit, um, and allow other guys to play up in the lineup and more. I mean, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I think we all agree that the, the the most tantalizing thing for Winnipeg Jet fans would be to see Hanel go in and you know, try and hang with a high-octane team uh, like Toronto. Although if they looked like they did last night, that might be the perfect time to uh, get a young player in to get a confidence builder. Because as you mentioned, they were lifeless. At times, Brandon, it seemed like that was a library that they were playing in last night. I mean, the Jets were carrying the play. Nothing to get excited about for fans that were there supporting the home team. Like, is they might need a funeral home sponsor. You're like, forget the Air Canada Center. Like, just call it, just call it Cropo and get him. Like, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's wild. Like, especially because you know, like I growing up watching hockey. Like the some of my first memories on TV are like the the early 2000s, and you have the Battle of Ontario, and the building was crazy. Like, right? Yeah. Like, it was like it might have been one of the one of the premier you know spots to in, in terms of home ice advantage and things like that. Like, the building would just get just raucous and loud and it stinks it's it's a bottom five atmosphere in the nhl you you could make the argument that you would rather see a game at mullet arena than in toronto right now and it's crazy right like it, it, it you shouldn't be thinking that but it, it just looks boring like there's 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 just nothing there right now and yeah i i really wonder you know what and if there's anything the leaves can do to kind of like just provide a jolt of life into this team. Like it's just, it, I know, I know they're in the whole, you know, regular season means nothing. Playoffs are everything mantra, but I mean, come on, like you gotta, you gotta get up for, for some of these games. And it just feels like the, the moves they made, like whether the composition of the team is off or too much pressure. What I mean, not, not kind of falling in line with what the coach is asking you for, maybe waiting for a coaching change. It it just feels like if if you continue to go down this route, surprise surprise, it's going to be six games and you're out come come springtime. So well, we saw the Islanders make a move. I'm surprised Toronto has kind of held off on that so far. Well, I mean, listen, they kind of they got a win. They lost to Vancouver. They got another win. They won this game. I mean, they're not doing it in impressive ways at all. We're going to talk about this with the Hayes coming up in just a couple minutes. Um, but. I mean, at one point in the second period, I said to my a buddy that I was watching the game with, I'm like, if you didn't know better and you just heard everything around Toronto, you'd think that these guys were playing to get their coach fired. I mean, they were showing nothing last night. And, of course, then the guys got benched on the power play for a little bit. Um, but bringing it back to the Jets, I mean, they didn't – like, nothing's easy playing against Winnipeg. And a lot of the things that Bones was particularly unhappy with in the Boston game – really did turn around. I mean, their ability to move the puck quickly, to get it out, to get it into the other team's zone. And there was a, a number of times, like, and not like with the top players on the Jets, like with the third line, fourth line had a couple lines where they were just living in the other team's zone and they started putting up the ozone time tracker. Um, and that speaks very well for uh, for what this team is. Now, you know, it's funny, B.A. says uh, he's giving you a wake up for saying, Stanley, you know, the team is can't score right now. They need offensive players. Like, I guess that's an easy take to have in the chat, but you know that Rick Bonus, like, what's his first concern? His first concern is can his team go out and play the same way? Because I guarantee you he thinks, and I think rightfully so, that if you have that exact performance nine times with those chances, those shots, limiting what you do on your own end, you're going to win way more than you lose. And that decision is going to come down to probably somewhat a philosophical decision as to are you trying to reinforce your strengths and hopefully have better results in some of the things that haven't been going well? Or do you change the way the uh, the makeup of that blue line is with the guys coming in and try and give them a little bit more chance? Like, I'm not sure putting Declan Chisholm in the lineup all of a sudden makes this team way more dangerous offensively. If anything, it's going to probably end up on the guys in the top four and think about the minutes those guys are going to be playing next game. Yeah, yeah. And again, like I look for me, Logan Stanley's ninth or 10th on the organizational depth chart for defensemen. Like I wouldn't be looking to put him in. But if you're talking about what the Jets are going to do, what have they kind of consistently done? 
They've like they they've given him chance after chance after chance, and they they just flat out think more of him than the majority of the fan base does. Like, we can disagree with it, but like those are the facts. They tend to give him more game time than just about any other defenseman not in the top six for the team right now. So again, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see what happens there. I mean. If you were to the other thing though, has this like if you're looking at a weakness for the Jets, I think puck moving is probably one of them outside of of Morrissey. And so while even if you put Chisholm in, for example, it's not going to oh you know we're going to be just fine because Chisholm can put up 50 points in the AHL, right? But at least it gives you a little bit more flexibility on the back end there, right? Um, so I yeah, I mean I, I would definitely lean towards a Chisholm or a Hainala for sure, but. I'm just not going to be overly surprised if we see a bunch of angry people Saturday afternoon saying, what in the world is Logan Stanley doing in the lineup? Just because, look, if they've done it before a bunch, why wouldn't we, why, why would we expect anything differently? Yeah, uh, and, and, it, and it's a very unique situation that you've got two defensemen that have been with the team forever, that are doing the bag skates, that are out there on the morning skates, uh, that haven't been in. And it might be difficult to jump both of those guys to bring a guy in the American Hockey League, even though we all know the way things played out in training camp when it comes to Billy Hainel. Let me move away from the Jets for a minute. Um, your guy Carter Hart's out now, uh, indefinite. I think we all know what's awaiting him and uh, four other players of that team. What does this do to the Flyers? I mean, they, they've had they've been such a great story this year. They've now lost three in a row. I think they've given up 18 goals in their last three games. They're in Detroit tonight. I mean, we don't even need to get into the specifics of what is coming to Carter Hart or how long um, he'll be gone or whether he's back at any point. Um, But I'm just, I mean, you know this team as well as any, Brandon. I mean, he is the most noteworthy of the players, I think, that um, have taken recent leaves from their NHL squads, potentially relating to the uh, 2018 World Junior Team. Um, where 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 is that and how much does this derail Philadelphia's season right now? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that all that stuff happens, right? So I mean, yeah, I think it's just a matter of what well, Monday that we kind of find out exactly what's going on there. Um, you know, and I don't know if this is because of the timing or anything like that, but I mean, there's a lot of Flyers fans taking the the off the ice things away for a second that were, you know, banging the drum for Sam Erson to be this team's number one goalie, even with the healthy Carter Hart. So does it totally derail their season? I mean, there, there's the, I guess, the off-ice impact that you don't really know how a team responds when a teammate goes through something like this because we've never really seen it happen before. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the team is really, really high on Erson. And I think Jets fans saw him in person – um, a couple of weeks ago, like the kids, the kids legit. I mean, who's the other guy? They, well, I mean, they called up Cal, they called up Cal Peterson. I mean, that's a pretty significant drop off, Peterson to Hart. I mean, there's no other way to put that. I mean, uh, Felix Sandstrom's the other guy in the AHL right now. They've got a bunch of pretty highly touted goalie prospects, but I mean, that's what a year or two that's away. Not at the very that's not right now. So I mean, yeah, I, I think the Flyers just. Urson takes over the crease. He's the number one. I think he gets 80% of the starts moving forward. And the Flyers hope that Cal Peterson plays like the first year in LA, Cal Peterson, as opposed to the guy that was a captain. That's crazy, man. He's making what five mil playing in uh, for Lee Valley. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, there's worse gigs out there. Well, that, no doubt. No doubt. Hey, the check still clears. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Listen, Samsonov's a perfect example of a guy that looked absolutely lost. They couldn't play him. They sent him to the minors. And yeah. we saw what he did uh, who he did last night. Hey, I got to play a clip for you and for everybody from last night. This is Los Angeles Kings captain no. Drew Doughty after the Kings blew a 3-1 lead on home ice to the Buffalo Sabres and lost, I believe, 5-3. Here's what Doughty had to say after the game. Team games. What has to change here? Um, I think we got guys in this room who are too worried about themselves and worried about their points and worried about stuff like that. We get a three-one lead tonight, and you know, guys start thinking it's a it's a cookie night, and we stop playing the way we know how to play. Have an awful second period, and then aren't much better in the third. Uh, it's about the team. It's not about yourself, and a lot of guys on this team are going to need to realize that. 
through this whole stretch of games, every game has been relatively close. Does this feel like maybe the bottom out for you guys with how the, the second and the third went? I mean, honestly, it's felt like the bottom out for a while now. Um, it's frustrating not getting these wins. We're trying to stay positive. We're trying to, you know, get back to having fun out there and play our game. But uh, it's hard to do that when you're on a streak like this. And uh, this is this has been a struggle for us. And the only way we're going to get out of it is if we get everybody's 100% effort and everyone playing for the team for each other. Cookie night. <laughs> I had to laugh at that. I mean, Brandon, it was McClellan a couple days ago. That's the way that that team responded. Um, our old pal PL did have a goal in the first period. I ended up finishing a minus one. And um, I mean, you can't help but think of him immediately when you hear a guy like Drew Doughty speak like that. What a mess in LA after a great start. Not particularly for Dubois, but for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, when you you sacrifice the depth that was such a big part in your success the previous season, for a guy that's supposed to be an eight and a half million dollar guy who's playing like he's worth half of that, that's that's the way the cookie crumbles. So it's <laughs> the level of Schadenfreude is is really you know, like that is pretty high in Winnipeg right now. I, I mean, it's just it's it's I think it's a case of like <laughs> we tried to tell you so. I don't think Rob Blake's going to answer a 204 area code phone call anytime soon either. This might blocked. Up, yeah, <laughs> 204 is just 204 in general is just blocked. Maybe you can get a 431 number and be okay, but 204, uh-uh. Um, this is, I mean, it's again, speaking of coincidences, how could it be a coincidence that this is now the third team in a row Mr. Dubois has been a part of that is doing some internal soul searching and asking, why are we playing? Like we don't give an F 50% of the time. So we've seen it here in Winnipeg. Um, it's just, I, I didn't think we'd see, I didn't think we'd see it four months into that eight year deal. Huh? So I thought it might be a little bit longer than that, but I mean, I, I, I have no idea where LA goes from here. Like it's, that's a poison pill. They have no cap space. I mean, little in terms of prospect, there, there's just, there's no get out of jail free card for them right now. And it's, Everything that could have gone wrong with that Dubois trade has gone 1,000% wrong for them and pretty much nothing but aces for, for Chevy and the Jets so far. Yeah, it is. Uh, I did my usual PLD search on Twitter after an ugly Kings loss, and I have already seen fans posting and doing a breakdown of what a buyout of oh, the no. eight, eight and a half million dollar We're already contract doing looked like. Yeah, it's, it's already got there. It's already got there 45 games in. Uh, great stuff. Hey, before we go, what do you think about these NFL games on the weekend? Who you got playing in the Super Bowl? Well, I hate, again, I hate to say I was right, but I, he asked me last week, Chiefs Bills, and it was, it was, a big, it was heartbreak again, and Mahomes gets it done. That's just, oh, believe me, I'm, I'm, I, I have no issue with your pick last week whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's so t- like so in the NFC. I, I, as much as I want Detroit to make it, I feel like last it the way the Niners are. Like I feel like every once in a while a juggernaut just has an off one, mm-hmm. and that's when you have to take advantage. And the Packers didn't. And I don't think we're going to see another egg laid by by San Fran on on Sunday. So I'd, for, I'd love to be wrong on this one. I do think the Niners are going to somewhat cruise to a victory. I I, I think Baltimore still gets it done. It's it's going to be a beauty though. Um, but man, the Ra- there's just no weakness with the Ravens. That's the th- I know Mahomes is Thanos, and it's like it's an inevitability. But like Baltimore is just really, really good. And the thing with the Ravens is, and probably what scares you the most, I'm guessing, they play their best against the best teams. Like they thrash contenders consistently. It's not a case of a paper tiger. So I I do think it's going to be a one-score game in the fourth quarter. I, I think the Ravens' defense shockingly gets a stop against Mahomes. And I think we see... The two one seeds go head to head in uh, in Vegas in a couple weeks. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, this is going to be this is the ultimate test, but also opportunity for Lamar, because Lamar's been yeah he's going to be a two time MVP. Um, he was one and three in the playoffs coming into this game, and I know C.J. Stroud had a great season, um, but I mean, playing a rookie quarterback on the road in his first start in the playoffs with house money. 
a little different than going up against a guy that um, is playing his sixth straight AFC championship game. So uh, well, I'm looking forward to kicking that one around tomorrow and, of course, looking forward to seeing the game on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Brandon, uh, new skates tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, new episode coming out. We'll figure out what to talk about. We'll see. I'm busy. I uh, the head spinning right now, so we'll, we'll we'll put something out tomorrow. I just want to see. Uh, I just like to uh, see your Jason Kelsey impersonation coming up on the weekend. Anyone? Anyone have a better time than that guy? No, no. And sadly, my body type is a little more Jason than it is Travis right now. So I mean, I saw. I saw. I was like, he's looking pretty good. Like maybe I gotta. Like, I might have to go salad instead of instead of past. Very so. agile, like just jumping in and out of the box right now. I mean. Uh, He's, that guy is so freaking popular right now. As a Travis I was gonna say, like, he might be like in terms of beauties, like the beauty power rankings right now. I don't know if I don't know who's topping Jason Kelsey right now. I don't even know who's coming close, to be honest with you, right yeah. now. I mean, he, as popular as he's always been in Philly, people getting a chance to kind of get to know him a little bit more through all the stuff that he's done. Um, he will be an absolute rock star in whatever he does in the media yeah. next year, assuming that he doesn't come back and play. Uh, Brandon, we'll look forward to a new skates and plates tomorrow. Thanks for doing this, dude. Beauty. Sounds good. Have a great weekend, guys. Right on, right on. Of course, Jets back in action on Saturday night against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, if you can afford it and check out, there's uh, some pretty expensive tickets on the resale market. Um, but why don't you get over to winnipegjets.com slash tickets and count yourself in for some of the games coming up after the player break and all-star game. February 10th, Saturday night against Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. Hell yeah. Uh, Valentine's Day. What What is more romantic than seeing the Jets take on the San Jose Sharks? And then, of course, the 20th of February. I know you all have it marked on the calendar. The Minnesota Wild return and the rivalry is renewed. Uh, don't forget, ticket packages available as well. Four, six, and eight games. Season tickets. They'd love to see you get back and a few people that had lost get back into seasons right now. It's a great time to do it. The team's playing real well. And uh, you'll be first in line to get your seats for the playoffs as well. So get on that. Get on over to WinnipegJets.com or give the office a call. And there'll be people there that will be more than happy to, uh, to help you out. I uh, do have to thank our friends at Princess Auto for their great sponsorship of Winnipeg Sports Talk and all they do for the local sports scene. Of course, the big announcement earlier this week that uh, the Bombers' home is now Princess Auto Stadium for the next 10 years. And uh, for a company that has been so devoted to the Bombers, it's a natural next step evolution. And great to see such a successful local company back the blue and gold the way Princess Auto does. Of course, they've got everything for you to complete the projects on your list or start something new. It is the coolest store around. Pop by and see in one of two locations, Panet Road or Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 over at princessauto.com. Uh, Wallace & Wallace are the fencing and overhead door specialists in town. I've been doing it since 1946. And while the fencing part of the business really ramps up as the snow melts, right now they're busy taking care of Winnipeggers overhead garage doors. Now, if you need a new one, they've got the best selection in town as the Clopay dealer in Manitoba with over 100 different garage doors. Uh, but they can also help you get that garage door you have right now up and down throughout the winter as it's working a whole lot harder with this cold right now. Give Wallace and Wallace a call to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and & Wallace. And just before we bring in Brian Hayes, guys, don't forget 2024 is here. We're looking ahead to a spring, summer, wedding season, and more. If you need to up your menswear game in the new year, you should get down to F Apparel at 190 Smith Street. Custom suits beginning at just 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, Custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and the biggest and best selection of menswear accessories around. If you're having a wedding or in a wedding party this year, talk to them about a 15% discount as well when you get your suits at F Apparel. Pop by and see them 190 Smith Street or check them out online and make an appointment to come in for a fitting online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. All right, Scott Billick a little later on. 
Right now, though, let's welcome in the host of TSN's Overdrive, Brian Hayes, for more Jets, Leafs talk and much more. Easy B, what's going on? Great to have you on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, I appreciate you having me. It's great to see you guys. And uh, I appreciate the Hayes and Bro shout out. We deserve the love. We had a tough, you know, regular season. But as we've been saying on the show for a long time, we are built for the playoffs and we're rocking, man. Those other two, Luke and O, they're awfully quiet all of a sudden. They're not so tough anymore. They, I mean, you guys need a, I, I hope there's a good sports psychologist around the uh, around the, the campus to, to take care of it. it it is really chained. I'm not sure whether it's better now that you guys are dominating in the playoffs or when you erase that massive deficit, even though it didn't come to fruition in the regular season because the the uh, the neckties were very tight for a while on overdrive. Yeah, they were. We got it down to, I think we were either one or two down. And then, admittedly, we absolutely soiled ourselves. I mean, we just started picking loser after loser after loser, and they took off. But it was amazing when Al's brother and I, we were chugging, man. We were feeling good. The group chat was on fire. People were getting on board online. And we almost pulled off, you know, the miracle comeback. But uh, it's playoff time. I think we're, you know, plus three or plus four, and they're running out of time. So we're feeling pretty good about ourselves right now. We'll get to the games in uh, in a minute. And great to see AB back on the program. Uh, but let's get to this game last night. Like, I'll, I'll just ask you from a Leafs perspective, you got two points. What what was the takeaway from last night's win over a uh, decimated Jet squad? Well, there's a few different things. I, I would start by saying I think a lot of people in Toronto were aware of the what the Jets had been doing all year, but they saw it up close and personal. Like, I was so impressed with the way they played. Like you mentioned, without Shifley, without Velarde, Mor- Morrissey goes down in the first period. Uh, Brassois and Net, you know, we've heard everyone knows what Hellebuck's been doing all year, and I'm sure we'll see him on Saturday night. But the Jets, I thought that first period in particular, that that is as dominant of a performance as the Leafs have faced in quite some time. Like they really were getting caved in. Um, and then from a Toronto perspective, there's a there's a few different things that stick out. But first and foremost is Ilya Samsonov. Like that's been a huge story all year is the goaltending situation. And he's kind of on a redemption tour. You know, it's still it's too early to to really, truly believe that this guy's, you know, officially back. We've compared him to Alec Manoa, the Blue Jays and his story where Manoa last year, it was just an unbelievable falling of grace, fall, falling from grace. And the same thing with Samsonov. Like he was playing earlier in the year at a level that was completely untenable. He had to go. They placed him on waivers in the 31 other teams. So we're not touching that. Um, and now he's come up. He's he started three games since then. He played great last night. Like he was the only reason they won. And, and that's a huge story for the Leafs going forward because Martin Jones, they've been riding into the ground. Joseph Wall is a rookie, and he's coming off a pretty significant injury. We don't know what he's going to bring to the table when he gets back. So Samsonov was huge. Matthew scoring his 39th. Like, this guy's a freak of nature. You know, there, there's a lot of 70 talk here in Toronto. Like, can he get there? And sometimes you got to have goals that, you know, where you weren't really factoring into the game. I didn't like his game last night at all. But he's on the doorstep. In overtime, he finds a way to tap one in. And, you know, from a league perspective, they've been largely inconsistent all year. They've been a very frustrating team, and uh, we witnessed that a lot last night. Um, You didn't like his game. I don't think Sheldon Keith liked his game either last night. Um, Man, I mean, some of the shots on the broadcast of just how pissed off he was at his players (laughs) were something else. And, you know, they have multiple power plays where the big boys are are sitting on the bench. I mean, uh, was that – what do you make the Keith right now with where he's at with these with this team? But most importantly, the guys that are going to make it or break it for him. I think he's obviously very frustrated. I, I think he's he's showing the same emotions that that the fans are showing that um, this team again has been inconsistent. Whether it's the eye test, where whether it's the analytics and the numbers, like they've been closer to the middle of the pack than a top 10 team this year. And that that's a change of pace because the last handful of years, you know, during the regular season, the Leafs have been one of the, you know, seven to 10 best teams in the league. Like they, they were a lock for 105, 110 points, you know, um, by this time last year and the year before you knew they were going to the playoffs, they were going to cruise to the playoffs and probably have home ice this year. It's a different story. Um, and I think special teams is a part of that. Their penalty kill has been really struggling all year. And their power play, there's no excuse for it. I mean, they, they've got the best goal scorer in the world in Matthews. Marner's, you know, one of the eight to ten best playmakers in the league, if not higher than that. 
and it's really been a a disjointed power play, a complacent power play, and he finally snapped, and he deserved to. You know, he had to, and he's Keith is in a precarious position here because you know his his approach. I think his natural approach to coaching is he's not an easy coach. He's not a pushover by any means, but he does believe in trying to prop up his players and being positive and finding the positive in their game. And I think that's particular particularly important for him in this market because of you know the media coverage the fans and you know how much focus is on this team so he generally reverts back to finding positives and pumping the tires of these best play of, of his of his players and he's also not he's not a stupid guy I mean he understands that this is a team that they're not loaded with depth you know they they don't have a great defense core Wherever they're going to go, they're going to need goaltending, they're going to need special teams, and they're going to need Matthews and Marner and Nylander and Tavares and Morgan Riley to to be at the top of their game. Like, if they're going to have any success during the regular season or into the playoffs, they're going to have to ride their big boys. So um, he's, he's well aware of that, Sheldon Keefe. Brian, the Jets, I mean, a significantly different team without Mark Shifley. And it, it's certainly given us lots to talk about as pertaining to the trade deadline for a team that's done so much. When you don't have your number one center in there, it really changes everything. And there's some guys playing up in the lineup that they, um, listen, took advantage of it and played well. But you're probably not going to score at a high level. And we kind of saw that last night. But, you know, from what you've seen from the Jets before, but as well last night with, you know, without some of their big guys in, what stands out to you about what Rick Bonus has done to get the Winnipeg Jets to where they are right now in the standings? I, I think it's how consistent they play defensively, how stingy they are, how I loved his comments after that Bruins game. Like that streak of 34 straight games of, of giving up three or less, that's an incredible streak. That's an incredible run. And they give up four on an empty netter and he's pissed <laughs> after the game. You know, he's. I love that he was complaining about their breakouts and how their passing wasn't crisp enough. And he was talking about the principles of their game. And I have a great appreciation for that. Like Rick Bonus, I think is well aware of of what Winnipeg is. And and they do have they have a lot of really talented guys. You mentioned Shifley. Connor's one of the the best goal scorers in the world. Ehlers is healthy. That sticks out to me. And he looks good. He could have ended it last night. Um, you know, Morrissey's a stud. But I don't think Winnipeg, in terms of like high end talent and game breakers, can match what Edmonton can bring, uh, even what Vancouver can bring. I would suggest probably not what Toronto can bring. But what they can do is is commit to a system, uh, play really stingy defense, rely on Hellebuck when they need to. And I think Bonus is well aware of that. And I, I have a real appreciation for him hammering home those principles. And I thought it was on display all night last night. Again, that's with Morrissey leaving. Like, Morrissey left in the first period. That looked gruesome, too, man. I don't want to know what happened there, but I think oh, I do. He may have paid the ultimate price. I think that was a serious price to pay Morrissey <laughs> last night uh, without Shifley, without Velarde. And and yet I, I thought systematically they, they were outstanding last night, and they pushed the Leafs to the outside, and they relied on what they know can work. And I, you don't see that a lot in the NHL. Like, you see a lot of cheating. You know, we heard Drew Doughty last night snapping on his guys that, you know, in L.A., players are chasing. I'll bet you it's Pierre-Luc Dubois could be a part of that. <laughs> it wouldn't be shocking if he did score last night. Um, but, you know, I, I think th the most impressive thing about Winnipeg for me, it's very similar to the Bruins. It's it's very similar to the Bruins, is they seem to play a, the same game every single night. Like, they commit to it. They know it's a plan that works. and And that's a rarity in the NHL right now. You know what has been fascinating, Brian? I'm just, you know, following this team so closely and, you know, seeing the ups and downs, but also the personalities of this team. How, you know, this year with Dubois moving along and the guys that came in from L.A. buying in the way they did. You don't know. I mean, let's face it. If you've been playing in L.A. for a while and you get the phone call, hey, guess what? You're getting traded. And it's to Winnipeg. I mean, it's a big upheaval in one's life. But the way that I follow the way that Velarde have really bought in and been a part of this at the start, I think, you know, in a lot of ways set the tone as well as Adam Lowry is the captain. Um, from a team building perspective, there is something to say that the sum can be greater than the parts. And I mean, I give Rick Bonus so much credit because the way that he said right off the bat, everybody here wants to be here. And, you know, it's probably easier to say that having Mark Shifley and Connor Hellebuck re-up for seven-year extensions that kick in next year. 
Um, but uh, from that, th- when you think of it, I know you guys talked about it in your program, all the noise about the Jets in the offseason as to where Hellebuck was going, what was going to happen with Shifley, it is quite an incredible turnaround to the fact that they're one of the most cohesive units and teams in the year without any of that noise, considering what everyone, and especially us, have been talking for the better part of 18 months heading into the offseason. It's incredible. I I honestly am shocked that it got to this point. Like in the summer, I thought they were dealing with a serious like fork in the road. And I thought they were going to go a different direction based on where the players were going to come from. Like I, from, from afar, I was like, is Shifley, you know, comfortable there? Is everything all good with Shifley? Hellebuck, you know, where's he going? And he had those comments, you know, day one of camp where before he had signed, where he said, you know, he just wants to win and he's going to do whatever he's got to do to win. And at that point, I'm like, is he setting the tone for possibly moving on or they're going to have to move from him? And obviously, in retrospect, if they moved off Hellebuck, moved off Shifley, needless to say, they wouldn't be in the position they were in. They're in right now. I mean, that that I think would have resulted in in basically a complete rebuild, reload, retool, three, five-year plan. Um, but they found a way to get Shifley to stay, uh, Hellebuck to stay. And to your point, everyone else has just fit in appropriately. Like Velarde, you know, obviously started injured, but since he got back and was healthy, when he has been healthy, the guy's been outstanding. I love Diafalo. Like, I love that pick. He's, he's exactly what you want in a depth piece guy that can skate, agitate, and score a little bit. Um, and I, I give full credit to, to Kevin Cheveldayoff because if you look at the way the Jets are set up, their cap system is is really, really solid. Like, they've obviously got Shifley locked in, Hellebuck locked in, Connor locked in. They got Morrissey locked in. I guess Niederreiter's locked in. Uh, I don't think Ehlers going anywhere. They're, they're going to have Perfetti for the long term because he's still on an entry level. So their cap system and their cap structure is really, really stable. And on top of that, they have all their draft picks. They have all their picks. I think they have Chicago's second or Montreal's second this year, right? It's one or the other. And that's going to be even better than their own, clearly. So you look at where they are, how well they're playing, the consistency in which they're playing, their cap structure – they, they have all their draft picks. I mean, it, it, it went from six months ago, me thinking this is this could be real trouble in Winnipeg to, wow, they're in a they're in a great position. And, and I got to give them all the credit in the world. It's it's just been uh, it's been really cool to see. Well, you know, Hellebuck's been brilliant all year. Well, I, I shouldn't say all year. Kind of a rough first two to three weeks for he and Brassois. I mean, but since then, they've had unbelievable numbers and Brassois I think showed that he's uh, very much worthy of getting more starts he's just in a tough spot but considering all the conjecture about Hellebuck being available how much buyer's remorse do you think there is around the National Hockey League considering some of the goaltending tire fires in the league knowing that one of the best in the world was there for the taking there there has to be so much of it like doesn't there, there there just has to be so it's like in the NFL if Lamar Jackson was available what were yeah. you thinking <laughs> like what were you thinking not going to get Lamar and it's the same thing with Hellebuck because it, it's it's such a difficult position to find consistency in there's like a handful of guys in the league and even that can fluctuate you look at Shesterkin and what he did two years ago I thought that guy was okay he, he's the next Hellebuck he's the next Vasilevsky his stats have dipped like, he has not stayed at that level. Hellebuck, every single year, feels like he's a stud. Like, you you can lock it in. You're like, this guy's going to be one of the three or five best goalies in the league. And and that is so valuable. And, you know, it, it's, it speaks to the importance of the position because it obviously is the most integral position in the sport. It's the one sport where – or the one position where if you have it – you're not guaranteed to win a Stanley Cup, but you're guaranteed to be in a very good position to chase it. But if you don't have it, you are guaranteed you're not going to win a Stanley Cup. Like your your dreams are dead if you if you have bottom third goaltending. You cannot win. I don't care how good your defense is, how good your forwards are. I know people reference Aiden Hill and all. Aiden Hill played well, and when he's been healthy this year, he's carried it over. He's played pretty well. So uh, having Hellebuck has got to allow Jets fans to sleep so easy at night. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of fan bases around the league that that would really be envious of, of that situation. And like you said, Brassois has been very good, too. Uh, you mentioned that second rounder from Montreal, of all teams, coming back in the Pierre-Luc Dubois trade, another little piece de resistance of Chevy from the offseason. But uh, I have to ask you, 
What do you make of the other side of that deal? The struggles of Dubois, where the Kings are right now, and what we're hearing out of the room from the coach and the captain over the last 48 hours or so. It's a disaster. Like, it's an absolute disaster. I didn't think it could get worse than Jonathan Huberto for, like, a first impression. I thought Huberto and Calgary, that's that's as bad as it could possibly get. I think Pierre-Luc Dubois has topped it. Like, he's he's not going to – he doesn't make as much money. I think Huberto's 10-5 per year on an eight-year deal, and, and Pierre-Luc Dubois is at 8.5, I believe it was. But an eight-year commitment, they traded really good pieces away to get him. And for him to show up and play the way he's been playing – it's it's absurd. I mean, it's just an awful, awful, horrible first impression. And like he's not he's this isn't him. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how people feel about him in Winnipeg. I'm sure they don't love the guy the way you know he went out or wanted to leave and made it relatively clear that that was his plan almost since the day he got there. But he's a good player. Like he's a really good player, and he's he's capable of playing much better. So maybe it's a transition thing. Maybe it's him trying to find a role with Kopitar there and Dano still there. And I, I don't know. Maybe he's not mixing well with the coach. I'm not sure what the explanation is, but it, it is wild how bad he's been. And then on the flip side, how good the Jets have been. And I, I'd like to believe teams around the league would see that as an example as to why you can't be a prisoner to your best players all the time. You know, we talk about it in Toronto all the time, and, and this ship has largely sailed because they they gave Nylander the contract and – you know, Matthews was going to get what he was going to get. And we'll see what happens with Marner this summer into next year. But Winnipeg, obviously, they probably would have preferred to keep Pierre-Luc Dubois when they acquired him. They probably thought when we get this guy, maybe he can be here for the next 10 or 12 years. And he wanted out, so they had to move on him. But it didn't collapse. They didn't fall apart as an organization. They made the move. They made a good deal. They brought in their people. And they said, let's keep going. Like, chin up, let's play. And I got a huge amount of respect for that. And I, I can't imagine, you know, Jets fans not just basking in that. The fact that Winnipeg's playing as well as they are. And Pierre-Luc Dubois is just a, it's a mess in L.A. Yeah, there'd be more than one or two people in the chat that might be searching PLD after these ugly losses. Did see a guy that had already calculated the buyout for Dubois' contract last Ooh. night after the yeah. game. That not a good sign. Uh, but you know what? The guys that have come here have sort of bought in and have been such so consistent and that's the one thing that Dubois isn't. I mean, if you look back at last year's series between Winnipeg and Vegas, it is the perfect encapsulation of Dubois as a player. Game one, he owned that game. He owned the Vegas Golden Knights, was the best guy on the ice, and in a lot of ways put a team on his back and won game one. By game four and five, you were wondering if he played. And that's obviously not cutting in L.A. with the uh, the commitment that they put forth. But I also wonder just how it's dealing with him because he's not a guy that has often really reacted to pressure very well. And listen, when you orchestrate a trade to the place that you want to go and sign for eight years at eight and a half million dollars, I hate to tell you, you might be in sunny California and the market might be different than Canada, but there's still a lot of pressure on you to come perform every night. And that hasn't happened yet in L.A. Absolutely. Internally, right? Like he walks in that dressing room and, you know, there were probably guys on that team that loved Gabe Velarde, loved Iafalo, loved them. And we're like, okay, we understand the business. We get it. And Pierre-Luc Dubois is here, but he's here on an eight-year deal at 8.5. And this is what we're getting. The guy's playing on the fourth line at times. You know, like you're, the, the pressure that comes from a dressing room is immense to say nothing of Todd McClellan, who's clearly wearing it right now. I mean, he is really wearing it as a head coach. Management must be furious with the way this investment is played off. Um, and, yeah, I, listen, I'll say this. He's lucky he's, he didn't he didn't end up in Montreal, right? He's lucky that it, it wasn't Montreal. Now, they're not nearly as good as L.A., and L.A.'s got, you know, playoff aspirations, cup aspirations. The Habs are not in that spot. But if he was doing this in Montreal, he'd be getting crushed. Oh, uh, imagine, crushed. imagine the circus around a guy that forced his way to a spot to be the homecoming hero and then – shows up once every four games. Oh, I it, would it would be wild. It would be wild. And and so from that standpoint, I get he probably can escape in L.A. He probably can get away from the rink and escape and reset. Um, but I'm sure the pressure when he's at the rink is immense. Um, and I'm sure he looks around the room and, you know, I, I'm sure he's a proud guy. And he, he, he wants to fulfill the contract and he wants to play well and he wants to win. Like, I, I have no doubt that that's the case. Um, but it, it's really been, it's been a terrible first impression for him. 
and you know even when the team was doing great at the top of the standings he they were like oh we'll give him a little bit more time it sounds like the patience has run out um brian back to leafs and jets do you i mean after samsonov's performance last night do you think we see him in the peg on saturday absolutely yeah you have to Uh, martin jones did an incredible job for this team like he he was signed as a third string guy they were Concern coming out of camp that he wouldn't get through waivers. He, he ended up getting through waivers. He started with the Marlies this year, and he he came up out of necessity because of injuries. Uh, and then he started playing every single game because they couldn't trust Samsonov and they couldn't play Samsonov. And this is a guy who's you know into his thirties. He's played a ton of games in the NHL. They went on that California trip. He played back to back games. He played LA one night and then Anaheim the next, and then San Jose on the Saturday came home for a few ga- few games, and then hit Western Canada, right? And and played Edmonton, played Calgary, played Vancouver. Like, he's playing all the time. And his numbers are starting to, to get bloated a little bit. He looks tired. He looks a little bit disjointed. He deserved the break. He needed a break. So they needed someone else to step in. And ultimately, their plan to start the year was for Samsonov to be the number one guy that that was the intention that he carries over the way he played last year where he was spectacular he was great in the regular season um and he's the goalie on record that that was in net when they finally won a series for the first time in in almost 20 years so that was always the plan samson the guy tandem with joseph wall when you get into crunch time you rely on the veteran who is samson and and you know he leads you to the promised land so I don't think they've completely reset that plan. Don't get me wrong, but he played great last night. He was great last night. He played well in Seattle over the weekend. And, you know, you got two days off in between games. Absolutely. I, I, I'm assuming it's Samson of Halibut on Saturday night. It should be a remarkable atmosphere. Then, you know, the Leafs are going into the all-star break where the all-star games in Toronto. So there's going to be a lot of action around that. And, they could use the break. You know, I think like a lot of teams in the league, they they haven't been riddled with injuries. They really haven't. Like they've been largely healthy outside of Joseph Wall and that, but they can find a way to get a point or two on Saturday night, get to the break. I think the Leafs and their fan base will be ecstatic with that. Brian Hayes is the host of Overdrive. I'm pretty much uh, turning on every day once we're done WST. The, the football picking segments – are as entertaining as anything. When is the TI? When does the tremendous information get dropped? We won't ask you for a pick, uh, but just a quick thought as well on the two matchups we've got for uh, Championship Sunday. Yeah, we got Friday. TG will be uh, back and better than ever. Tremendous information plus gut instinct equals playoff success. That's generally what we like to advocate for. So on Friday, we'll be doing that. Um, I, I love this, these matchups. I mean, I, as a Packer fan, I was heartbroken last weekend. It, it would have been phenomenal to see Green Bay go into Ford Field. And you guys play were the right there, Brian. Right, right there. They, right had, there. they had it. They owned that game the whole night, and they let it get away from them. And then Jordan Love, you know, started looking like like a, a, a kid. You know, he really – I think the moment became too big for him, which was expected at some point that was going to happen. But I, I love the idea of, you know, Brock Purdy having to continue to prove himself um and Lamar Jackson I think there's a lot of a lot of pressure on Lamar like he's you, you got Mahomes rolling in Mahomes is going to perform like he's as clutch as anyone I've ever seen Brady included I fully expect Mahomes is going to show up and play well so I think Lamar is going to have to have himself a game uh I think both games are going to be close uh, I don't think there's like a bad outcome I think any outcome Baltimore Detroit Super Bowl awesome Niners Chiefs Super Bowl awesome like you you got four really compelling stories I think four really good teams, and and it should be a great weekend. You know, down in Southern Ontario, I know you're a Packer fan, but you're surrounded by quite a bit of the mafia. Uh, mm-hmm. Has it just been a week of mourning after uh, Mahomes went and did it again on Sunday? No, uh, it's crushing, man. You, you, there's so many Bills fans, you know, here in Toronto, and like you said, Southern Ontario, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, and there's such a connection to Buffalo. Like that's that's our like American city. You know, that's where you cross the border. You go to Buffalo, and um, it's I'm not surprised because of what he's proven. Like, anyone's surprised that Mahomes went in there and played the way he played. Shame on you. I mean, what were you expecting? The guy was going to go in there and and start throwing picks and be awful? I mean, that wasn't going to happen. But it was such a great game, and it was so heartbreaking. Like, if you're a Bills fan, it's almost like those four Super Bowls. Like, wide right was, was the first one. Right. And then as it went on every year, it got progressively worse. They just kept getting blown out. 
And you're like, all right, fine. They're blown out. At least we knew it. Like first quarter, second quarter. The thing is about all these losses, Buffalo against Kansas City, three of the last four years, is they're all close games. They're great games. Like the the miracle in 13 seconds, that's an unbelievable game that happened to land in favor of the Kansas City Chiefs, which is heartbreaking. And then you fast forward a couple of years and you got wide right, part two. And this time at home. And you finally had him. You finally had Mahomes at home. You had Allen do what he was doing. It's crushing, man. I, I I feel for Bills fans because they've been through the ringer. Um, and listen, it's it's not going to get any easier because Mahomes is only 28. He's not going anywhere. Lamar's not going anywhere. Joe Burrow's going to get healthy again. Like, I think Allen will get it done at some point. I think he will, and I, I believe it will happen in Buffalo. I certainly hope so. But, man, you, you, you only get so many cracks at it, and they had a real opportunity last Sunday and. They couldn't get it done, and now they got to watch Mahomes just keep rolling, man. It's crushing. You know, way way too much is being made about that field goal. I mean, it was the fact that they were kicking a field goal at that time. Does anybody actually think that Mahomes wasn't going to get some points with 140 and two timeouts left? I exactly. feel bad for Bass, but uh, it was done before that. Listen, Brian, this has been awesome. We'll look forward to the game on Saturday heading into the player break. It should be, uh, as always, when the Leafs are in Western Canada, uh, an interesting atmosphere in the building. Uh, I think both sets of fans will be fired up, but uh, keep up the great work on Overdrive. Say hi to O for us, and uh, thanks so much for jumping on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, great stuff with Brian Hayes. And again, you can check out Overdrive on uh, 1050. Uh, I usually just check it out on the tube afterwards and uh, key PVRing. You can kind of rip back if you start the show late. Get some of the fun segments, but uh, the guys do a great job and having a lot of fun on the program. And uh, we thank Brian for jumping on with us today. Uh, well, cheers to Brian. Hazy B, good luck in the picks on the weekend. We'll cheers him with uh, one of Winnipeg's favorite local beers, Little Brown Jug, the standard for local beer in town for uh, over five years now, featuring 1919, their flagship brand, as well as the new generic lager, which you can pick up in beer stores and your local liquor marts for $19.99, an eight-pack of Tall Boys. Great deal. You can also pick up singles at $2.99. The best place to uh, get your Little Brown Jug on is at Little Brown Jug in the Exchange. The brewery and tap room's there. You can try all of the favorites, including many small batch brews that you can't get in beer stores. Check out their merchandise and more. And tell them your friends at Winnipeg Sports Talk sent you. Uh, of course, littlebrownjug.ca as well online. You can order with local delivery options and check out all those great merch options as well. Um, big slate of games in the league tonight. We'll get to those later on in the Cool Bet lines, as well as a, a couple exclusives we cooked up in the lock shop. But if you are heading out to watch the games tonight, no better place to do it than your local Boston Pizza Enjoy some ice cold schooners scarfed down on world famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And of course, you can always get the great taste of BP ordering to your home hot and fresh by hitting them up at bostonpizza.com. And uh, hey, I, uh, I, I know the WST crew was going to be in the house. Uh, let's step up our game when it comes to your favorite jerseys, hats. We need to represent on Saturday night. And if you are needing to up your Winnipeg Jets gear, you need to head on over to Royal Sports. Uh, thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise, including many exclusives you won't find anywhere else. All your favorite jerseys with your favorite players, name and numbers ready to go. And don't forget, it's also the 48 night. So the Jets will be wearing uh, those specialty jerseys for the second of three times this season. You want to check out those, of course. It's all there at Royal Sports at 750 Pemina Highway. Check out the NFL gear. Tons of bomber merchandise as well. The biggest hockey section in town. And, of course, other great stuff to dominate winter like snowboards, boots, bindings, and all the cool stuff over on the King's Skate Snow and Surf side. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Give them a follow on Instagram as well at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And uh, just before we bring in Billick, Big cheers to our friends, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. I know it's more ice fishing season right now than getting on the water, if you will. But that time will come soon, and space is filling up right now for the 2024 season. If you want a world-class fly-in fishing experience, whether it be with business and clients, longtime friends, 
or uh, just want a great place to go with that someone special to get on the water. And as great as the fishing is, the incredible hospitality, the Turin family, and the Aikens team is that much better. Find out more, AikensLake.com, and uh, hit them up on their socials as well, at Aikens Lake. All right, Billick joins us as we uh, move on from last night and look ahead to uh, Saturday. Scotty, how are you? Good, man. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. I mean, honestly, I mentioned this earlier in the program today, but I mean, if the Jets had found a way to win that game in the third period or score yeah. on the four-on-three power play or win that game, I think we would be sitting here talking about another signature win of the season for a team that had a decimated lineup, yeah. missing a top, top, your, you know, two of your top two forwards, including your number one center, getting seven minutes out of Josh Morrissey before he had to leave the game and not return, your backup goalie in there. Um, I mean, really hard to pick anything about the Jets' performance other than a lack of a little finish to beat uh, Samsonov at least once. Yeah, I mean, to me, I mean, I wrote this last night. I, mean, I thought that was one of the most impressive games we've seen from the Jets this year. Like, you, you have to look at the, like, the situation, given the fact that, yeah, I mean, you're out Shifley, you're out Velarde, and after whatever it was, 16, 17 minutes, you're out Josh Morrissey. And it's just like, you know, and then you look at the stats, and I was looking at, the, like, the underlying numbers last night. I'm like, man, like, this team was doing really well five on five. And then the second period basically played half of it on the PK. And they're still good, right? Like, I mean, this is the thing about the Jets' penalty kill now. I think it's 26 for 27 over the last 10 games. Like, they've jumped up five spots in the standings with, or in the rankings. I mean, it, it's not much. I mean, 22nd place isn't isn't the greatest place, um, you know, to, to be. But the fact that they're kind of figuring it out now it is a good sign. Uh, I think we're just talking about, again, the same thing we're normally talking about. It's, you know, you have a four on three in overtime for 100 or 125, and you find, I think, one shot the whole time. And it's just like, that's not, that's not enough right now. And so I like, I think, I mean, Nate Schmidt said it after the game last night. He was talking about how kind of Scott O'Neill challenged that PK to be better, to be as good as it was last year, to, to kind of sort it out because it can take this team to the next level. I, I think now Brad Lauer has to challenge the power play to s essentially do the same because I, I think the thing that's holding this team back from getting to that next level, which is still a scary thought if you're an opponent of the Winnipeg Jets. But, I mean, the Jets win that game if they score a power play goal last night, right? I mean, and I think that's – I mean, if they score a five-on-five five goal, they win that game. You know, they, they just weren't – yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we're just we're talking again about a power play that needs to find them a goal sometimes because it's just not happening. And you're right, the, there was a little lack of finish. They had their chances. Um, you know, I, I don't think Kyle Connor's fully back yet. If let's you know, let's just say that I don't think he's found his kind of his range, his accuracy, that sort of thing. And he looked yeah, frustrated at times him. last night. I he mean, did. He did. Yeah, and, and I think it's just, you know, he, he scored one empty net goal in, what is it, five games now since he's returned? Four games, five games, something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just not what he's thinking. And I, I just don't think the power play is clicking the same way. And I don't think the top line's is clicking the same way. And so I think there is some frustration there for sure. But, uh, you know, this Jets team's too good not to score a goal in a game. And last night they didn't score a goal. And that was the difference. You know, um you play that game ten times the way that it rolls oh. out. A few of those games or goals are going to go in, and yeah, I know there's a lot of talk about how the Jets are making all these goalies look like uh, world beaters. I mean, to me, this is a very different game than Boston. I mean, Boston, yeah. the Jets were hanging on for dear life. The Bruins were relentless. The Leafs were the opposite of that that last night. The Jets were the ones that looked relentless on the forecheck, carried the play. Um, yep. And again, over the course of 82 games, you're not winning every one that you probably deserve to it. And I would argue that they definitely did deserve to win that game last night. Um, that being said, yep. they got a point. It's the regulation losses that kill you. Yeah. But what's interesting about this, Scott, is they're going right back against the same team on Saturday night. And unless this, unless the Leafs are just completely lifeless and are trying to get their coach fired right now, <laughs> I yeah. would expect them to be a hell of a lot better. Although I expected that in the third period last night, and we yeah. didn't really see that. And maybe that's credit to the Jets and the way that they played with everybody stepping up, especially the guys on the blue line. 
Well, yeah. But without Josh Morrissey, um, who, and again, we'll get an update tomorrow, I'd imagine, on Josh's status. Yeah. But considering he did not return to the game last night, I think there's obviously a big possibility that he won't be in the lineup tomorrow. Um, we were talking about this Brandon uh, with Brandon earlier. Um, oh, for I'm one really... night, for one game, <laughs> um, do you go to the young guy that has been playing with the Moose? Yeah. And skip over two guys that have been good soldiers that have been doing everything they need to do while nobody's been hurt and they've just sort of been seven and eight <laughs> on the depth chart. Yeah. Or do you go to Logan Stanley or Declan Chisholm, who uh, seemingly are ready and waiting for their chance to get in? Uh, you know, we put it out as a why not question of the day earlier on, and I think you yeah. probably have a pretty good idea about where a lot of the fans are. Um, I guess it's a it's a two prong question. What would you like to see? And what do you think will happen? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I tweeted it out last night. I think that they should bring Billy up and let him play a game. He's the guy that has the most game experience over the last, like, six weeks, right? Like, I mean, Declan and Logan Stanley haven't played. Plus, I think at some point, you have to reward Billy Hainala for the camp that he had. And to show, like, for Rick Bonus to come out and say, like, this kid would have been in the starting lineup that night, okay, you know, now let's come out and, and, and prove that, well, not even improve, just bring him out and let him play. Like, Logan Stan- like if you're losing Josh Morrissey, one of your problems is Logan Stanley's not filling his shoes. And and no offense to Declan Chisholm either, he's not filling those shoes either. You know who can possibly try and at least put a foot in Josh Morrissey's skate? I think it's Billy Hainala, right? Like, I think here's a guy who can move the puck up the ice. He has some good offensive instincts. Is he going to be as good as Josh Morrissey? No, obviously not. I mean, Josh Morrissey is a Norris candidate. Um, but if you put him alongside Dylan DeMello, what's the? I, I mean, I just don't think. Wait a the second, worst you actually th- you're actually thinking about putting I, I, him out on the top, like on the top you, line and to running him, him like Morrissey there. time. I hundred percent. You don't think I, that's setting him up to fail? I don't. No, I think Billy is the type of player that likes to take advantage of those opportunities. And, and you know, I, I mean, you know, we're talking one night only. We're talking about Josh Morrissey not playing. You don't want I, – I think Dylan Sandberg and Nate Schmidt have been in very well together. I mean, you could put Neil Pionk up there with 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 Dylan DeMello, and you could run with that. You could give Brendan Dylan Billy. That, that's fine with me too. But, you know, what, what is – again, what, you we watched a team last night that limited – Austin Matthews to absolutely nothing until a tap in in overtime, right? But everything prior to that, the Jets absolutely annihilated that Austin Matthews line with Mitch Marner. They were better than than that team. I mean, they did most of that without without Josh Morrissey in the lineup. Um, I just don't think that the I, I'm I'm not saying that. I don't think it's setting them up to fail. No, I, I think that you like can. The put reason this the reason why I asked that. And the reason why I asked that, and listen, I love Billy, and I'm really excited to see him yeah. get in the lineup, and I'd be fine if he was there. Yeah. But to expect him to come up, like the foundation of this team is defense. Like we know that he can do some exciting yeah. things in the offensive end. I do wonder, and I'm sure the coaches wonder, whether he can hang for big minutes playing against the top players in the league right. in their own in their own end. And, and again, that's what their focus is. I think this is a great time to figure it out, Huss. Right? Like this. Okay. So here's the thing: we're gonna have to. We're gonna get to a point here over the next six weeks where we're gonna watch this team make some pretty interesting decisions. Right? Mark Shifley is gonna be healthy at some point. Um, David Gustafson is gonna be healthy at some point. They're going to have to insert these guys back into the lineup. Right? There's already 23 out of 23. You have two defensemen that aren't playing. You have another defenseman that are, well would have been in the opening lineup, but got really we well, got hurt and you know some really bad luck and and went from there. But at some point, you're going to either have to poop or get off the pothouse, right? Like because you're you, you're going to move like Billy. People are going to come calling asking for Billy. You're going to come calling asking for other people. But I think what you'd like to see, and I, I know you're not going to get a full kind of picture of this with Billy uh, by playing one night against the Toronto Maple Leafs, but I think you would like to see what you have in the guy. I'm not saying this is a throwaway game. I'm not saying it's anything like that. I think the Jets played a really good game last night and lost in overtime to a goal on some bad coverage at the end of it. I think, like you said, off the you know earlier in the in the segment, I think if this team plays 
that game over 10 times, they probably win eight of them because they just, they shut down that entire offense. And that's all the Toronto Maple Leafs really have is offense. And then they had a goaltender who's embattled the entire season, put on a hell of a performance and good for Ilya Samsonov. But I just, I don't think that it's, I, I don't think it's bad to put Vili into that spot. And I think really at the end of the day, this team needs to figure out what they have in him because I think people are going to come calling. And if it becomes this thing about, you know, do you get Chris Tanev or do you get, I don't know, whoever, right? I mean, there's a lot of guys, Elias Lindholm, whoever it is, if you're really going to swing for the fences, you're going to have to take, you know, you're going to have to bring out the big guns to try and do so. Um, and I think that they still need to figure out if Billy is going to be one of the guys in the future here or if he's a guy that they figure now, I mean, he, he, you know, if, does he have some value? And I think he does in the trade market. So go do that. But, I mean, whatever. I, I think we all know what's going to happen, right? Like, I think, you know, to answer the, the other part of your question, I think it's just either Logan Stanley or Declan Chisholm. And, and I don't know which one goes in. I mean, you could probably put Declan in. He moves the puck better than Logan does. Uh, you don't really need the size right now against the or, – or the whatever against the, the Toronto Maple Leafs. I think, I think we know what the answer is. But – I would like to see Billy. You ask that. That's where yeah, I'm at. I'd like I, I, listen, I, I would love to see him too. I, I'll tell you this though. I think that whether it's Billy or whether it's any of those guys, but particularly Billy, because we're talking about him. I mean, he's yeah. not jumping all of the regulars that played their asses off last night for 20 plus minutes nope. into the top four. And I, and to be honest, I think that makes more sense. Like if you're bringing him in right now, I mean, yeah. put him with. I mean, I guess it would probably be Nate Schmidt. On that third, on that third pairing, I let him go out. I would love to see him. I mean, to me, the biggest benefit of him, or Chisholm for that matter, if he gets in, but I think specifically Hanela, is yeah. that we might get a chance to see what he can do on the power play, and that I think, because we've talked so much about the power play and the fact that it just isn't going right now, Billy Hanela in particular, a spark to that power play would be the thing. But yeah. I, I, I think it would be. Um, I don't think it would be in his best interest to go and throw him in. Hey, here, you're new yeah. Josh Morrissey. Go and do what well, Josh does because you don't have I think you're setting a young minutes, man up right? to up to uh, up in, in in a spot. Right. There, there's grades to it. And let's face it, when he made the team, he wasn't making the top pairing. He was going to be on the third pairing. You know what I'm saying? He was. I, I agree with you. I don't think you have to play him 25 minutes at night either. And, and I think that we wouldn't expect that. But I think you can put him with Dylan DeMello and see what happens. That's all I'm saying. But you're right. You're probably I – mean, yeah, I think, again, you asked me what I'd like to see. I'd like to see Billy there. I think what we're going to likely see is one of the two that you talked about who have been the good soldiers, who have been, you know, doing uh, – you know, putting in the practice work and all that stuff. Um, I And, again, I think, you know, if they bring Billy up, unless they put Josh Morrissey on IR – they got to make a move, right? And so that's the other problem. Well, that I think they have that too. I think look, the only way that Billy comes up is if Josh Morrissey goes on IR. Right. Yeah. But again, exactly. it's a week. It, has to, it can yeah. only be a week, and the week goes into the player break. So I think that yeah. that it's that's a non-starter. Like I think they'll be able 100%. to do that if that is the case. Yeah. So we won't have to get into this uh, into this roster situation, um, and that roster yeah. situation. I mean, the the fact that the team played the way they did last night. I, um, you know, and not getting two points, it does make me a little nervous about Saturday night's game and that you Think have so? to imagine the Leafs are going to be a, a much better team than last night. I, as I said, unless they're just, they've checked out because they uh, well, they had nothing. And we've seen that team play a much, at a much, much higher level. Right. And maybe it's just credit to the Jets for the way they didn't let, say, the, like, let the what, team what, do what anything. Is the, what is the reason why Toronto had nothing? Is it because Toronto played a bad game? Or is it because the Jets played a great game and really limited them five on five, and, and that's what I want to like. I mean, I guess that's what Saturday might tell us, right? Because I think at the end of the day, the Leafs are going to come out probably thinking they stole one last night. The Jets came out, I and mean, you listen to the Jets after the game last night. I don't think they're really upset about anything. Like I think they know they played a good enough game to win, and just didn't get the bounce that they needed in the end, right? I mean. Yeah, you know, they had they had a pile of shots. They, I mean, the scoring chances I think were twenty three to eight. I mean, it was you know the Jets played a, a, a hell of a game, and and but I don't think that you know they responded after the Boston game. You heard Nate Schmidt talk about that last night. You can't come out against a good team and 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 play flat. Essentially, is what the is the Jets did. They they you know they, they fixed that for the Toronto game. Um, I think the blueprints there. I, I don't know. 
I'm not sure it's any different Saturday night than it looked last night. I mean, if the Jets come out and play to that structure, this is what they do to teams, right? Like this is what they they completely neutralized those for that first and second line of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And at that point, they don't have much else. And and so what they had last night was good goaltending, really good goaltending. You know, and 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 at the end of the day, that's what it was. The Jets did it too. Um, you know, LB had a hell of a game himself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not sold on the fact that the Leafs are better than what we saw last night. Sometimes they just, they're not, they just, they're, they're missing some stuff on that team. And we've talked about that and we've heard about that all year. They just don't have, they have a lot of high end talent there that they, they can come at you a little bit on offense, but you know, the Jets shut them down last night and didn't give them much in the middle. And the Leafs didn't really look all that dangerous. They've, That's got, my a very, they've got a really pissed off coach too. I can tell you that. I mean, those <laughs> shots of, yeah, yeah Keith Matthews is. and Marner and Nylander sitting yeah. on the bench for the entire power play was something else. I'm glad you brought up the PK because, I mean, while I think everyone in the lineup, the way they hung in there last night, I mean, deserved a lot of credit. The yeah. turnaround in the PK is uh, is an important development and probably even more important than the power play, although the power play at times, and last night was a perfect example, you don't yeah. get to that point to give yourself a chance to win if your PK isn't that good, and that's why I think most coaches would say, if we're going to have one elite unit, like let's make it the PK that keeps us in games, especially when you play and score the way the Winnipeg Jets have done for most of the season at 5-on-5. Five five. Um, but figuring out that power play is something that needs to happen. And, I, I you know, listen, as long as Mark Shifley's out in particular and Gabriel Velarde, um, you know, it, it's probably going to be a uh, a work in progress. But I did like some of the things that, you know, were happening, but less so with the top players last night. Like, I'm sort of with you that Kyle yeah. Connor isn't quite where he's at. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, he and Ehlers, um, they are sometimes challenging. Maybe if they have to play together for a consistent period of time, where they don't have Shifley and those two are really the drivers. To me, I think Ehlers is the best driver of a line, and that's why yeah. I think in a lot of ways they put him with Cole Perfetti as a guy that can really be that offensive uh, that offensive cog. Uh, but for a team right now that hasn't scored very much, Saturday night we're going to be looking at 81 and 27 to see if they can give themselves a little bit more chances to, to make something happen and bottom line, finish and turn the light on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it, right? Because that line last night with Connor and Nemestikov, I mean, they out-attempted their opposition 21 to 11, and I think they outscoring chance yeah, their opposition 11 to 2. Like, it was there, and they just didn't have the finish. And that's something you don't really expect from, I mean, great save by Ilya Samsonov on the toe drag on Nikolai Ehlers, right? I mean, that that's that's Ehlers' bread and butter. Like, I mean, we talked to Nate Schmidt after the game last night, and he was talking about, how difficult that is to to defend and how difficult that is for a goaltender to to kind of deal with. And and so I again I thought that line was good. I thought Nemestikov was a good center in, in between those guys. Like I think I think that change it didn't pay off in terms of goals, but having him Nemestikov there in between them instead of Adam Lowry and having those two together, I, I think it worked well. And going back to the third line, I worked really well last night. So yeah, I mean, I, again, I think it's just you got to put a puck in the net, and I, I think, I think at some point Kyle Connor is going to hit two or three, um, and and he's going to be off the races. And we know Nikolai Ehlers has been, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call it streaky. He's got seventeen or sixteen goals this season, um, but you know he is dangerous too. And and so like I like, I really like that 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 I guess you call it the number one line um, last night without Mark Shifley in it, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think again, I just think you got to, you just got to put one in the net. That that's really all that was missing from that game, especially from that top line, because they played really well last night on the road, which is interesting because you know you would think that, that the Leafs would have been able to match up against that line well. They didn't. They didn't have an answer for it. The only answer that they, that team actually had for that line was Ilya Samsonov. And so, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I assume Samsonov is playing again. He hasn't been consistent all year. Um, you know, but uh, again, I, I, yeah, I think the jets are going to come out and, and, and unless they lay an egg, I mean, I think you're going to see a lot of the same, uh, and you know, if they get a few pucks to go in, I don't want to call it a blowout. Um, but you know, I think they can beat this, this Leafs team pretty soundly. 
Well, I, listen, I, I will sort of agree with you that if they had one or two go in earlier on, the way that that game went, I mean, it probably yeah. would not have been close. Um, but right now, uh, I don't know if we can really expect the Jets to have a massive offensive explosion <laughs> the way they're currently constructed. Did like to see Lowry back with Appleton and uh, and uh, Niederreiter last night, and that yeah. was a line that, and, and particularly, I mean, we've talked a lot about Adam Lowry and what he's done for this team as the captain with his leadership. Um, he was throwing the body last night. He and Neil Pionk actually were hitting everything that they could last night. I, I love the edge on Pionk's game as well, but both of those guys sort of stood out to me as um, raising their level right now, knowing what's needed of of guys that you know are filling in for pretty very well, very important players. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the one thing you see with Adam Lowry often, right? When a guy is injured, I mean, he's the guy to step up. It's just something that he. He understands and, and understands the moment and, and really is able to capture it, right? Like there's a lot of guys who want to step up and do better, um, but don't, don't always aren't able to do that. But I think, you know, one thing that Adam Lowry and I guess Neil Pionk do is when they lay the body like that, like, I mean, that you talk to players about, you know, big hits and stuff, especially from Neil Pionk too at times, because Neil Pionk's not the biggest guy on the ice. And I don't I remember the guy he had on the trolley tracks last night, but that that hit would have been devastating for whoever. Well, it might have been devastating for both players. Um, you know, eventually I forget who it was, but he, he got out of the way or kind of moved over and it just like yeah, it it looked more of a train wreck than anything. But but that would have been yeah, that would have been just a ridiculous hit. But but this is the thing with Neil Pionk is and I think this is what we're seeing from him this year a little bit more. It, well, more than than at least last year, and and uh, well, basically just last year because that's when he was injured for most of it, and 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 played through whatever he was playing through. There, he still won't tell us what it was, but you can tell that Neil Pionk is healthy right now, and and the reason is, I mean, he's hitting everything that moves. He can skate again, right? Which is one of the problems that he had last year. Is just it was difficult for him to push off his right foot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think they, those guys just know when to bring the energy, right? And I thought last night they did that early and often. And, yeah, it, it's it's a big help for this team because I think, you know, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be shocked right now um, if this team just isn't really tired. <laughs> you know, like I, I think this team has gone through a lot, the 9-15 stretch. I mean, I know they've had a break, but you go on the road and it's just not the same. And, you know, I think this team is probably, you know, expecting like, you know, they're just waiting for the break um and that sort of thing but yeah i mean i think you know guys like adam lowry you know he's the captain and he sets the tone right i mean we, we've listened to this i don't know if everybody caught the sports net thing last night the little round table that they did you know i thought that was interesting i talked to adam a couple of the teammates for a story i did a couple of weeks ago and you know they all follow adam and i think adam understands that and i think adam comes out in a game where you're missing velarde and you're missing uh, Mark Shifley and, and you're eventually missing uh, Josh Morrissey and, and he just knows when to turn it up he's not the raw raw guy is what a couple of guys told me but he's the guy that goes out there and does the raw raw with his shoulder or with his fists or whatever it is so yeah I'm, I mean, I'm interested to see how they come out on Saturday I mean I, I think I think in the past you would have looked at this as okay this is sort of a I don't want to call it a scheduled loss but it, this is a this is a game where you You'd, you'd be a little more forgiving uh, if this team was, you know, was had one foot out kind of the, the door and just waiting to, to kind of kick their feet up for a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to see that. I think these Toronto games, and I, I mean, I, I, I assume it's going to be a sellout on Saturday. I think it's going to be a hell of an atmosphere there. It always is because there's half of the places Leafs fans and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, a nice little kind of send-off uh, before we have this kind of well, week off. Well, you'd certainly like them to uh, finish off this uh, pre-All-Star yeah. portion yeah. of the team, of the uh, schedule with a win. And uh, you know the guy that's going to be front and center is 37, Connor Hellebuck, who uh, oh, yeah. watched his his goaltending tandem partner play brilliantly last night. And again, he didn't have much to do in the first couple periods, but man, did he make some big, big saves in the third period. And that would have been a devastating loss. I mean, if that thing didn't get to overtime, despite the fact that the team didn't yeah. score a goal the way they played, uh, I think would have been a lot tougher to swallow. 
and you'd look back at the regulation losses as the one that really hurt the ones that really hurt you as opposed to a getting up a point but uh you know that we'll be a very much a motivated Connor Hellebuck looking to make a statement after a, what uh, LB did last night in the first of the home and home yeah i mean i think Connor Hellebuck is so dialed in right now it's it's i mean we're looking at a guy who i mean i don't know how uh, it would be an epic epic collapse if he loses the loses the Vesna. I mean, I don't think there's any way to say we're looking at the at right at the moment right now. We're looking at the 2023 or I it's guess a two horse race. Vesna. Yeah, I mean it is. And Demko has been I, really, really good for Vancouver. Demko and their record really is going to get them <clears throat> that consideration as well. But I'm with it you. Is. I mean, it's Connor Hellebuck, Gap, Demko, Gap, everybody yeah. else. Yeah, and I think the stats back that up. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Demko's had a hell of a season, and and I think there are some naysayers on even even in this town that say it's more about the five on five. Trust me, don't get me wrong. That's certainly helped this team's goaltending. Um, but I think the reason why we're seeing this team so good is because of the marriage between the five on five play in front of Connor Hellebuck and Connor Hellebuck's ridiculously good goaltending so far this season. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Hellbuck's also going to come out not too happy that he lost that Boston game. Um, so you got that on, on, on there as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think we're going to watch a really fun game on Saturday and, uh, and hey. I, you know, I think that's, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Austin. Hey, just before we go, I, I've yeah. got to ask you. Are you going to ask me about the chiefs again? Cause I was no, wrong no. last week. <laughs> no, well, for sure. I mean, please keep on being wrong. Good betting against Mahomes. I always love no, that. I'm going to bet on. <laughs> I, I have to ask you about, uh, uh, and we talked about this Brian Hayes earlier in uh, Rewiki. Yeah. The obligatory, oh my God, what's happening in LA question. And what we've heard from McClellan oh, first boy. and then Doughty cookie Doughty. night last night. Cookie Holy night. smokes. What a, what a sound bite. What a, what a quote. But I mean, that's, I don't get it, man. Like, I, they started so well. I mean, we saw how well that that team played here. What is it, the third game into the season when Dubois made his return here? And it looked like, I mean, it didn't look like Dubois, or, you know, they had won the trade or whatever, but it, things have changed. <laughs> things, have, things have changed quite a bit. And and I don't know. I don't know who Doughty's talking about. I imagine it's not Anze Kopitar, though. You know, I imagine it's not Philip Deneau. Um, you know, like I, I assume it's not some of the veteran guys that have led those teams to Stanley Cups. I mean, I don't know, obviously, haven't, but we know Anze Kopitar and his pedigree. Um, was that pointed at uh, a guy like Pierre Luc Dubois? Like, here's the thing about Drew Doughty he doesn't hold back and he doesn't care, right? I mean, this is a guy that, that, that knows how to win. He's won Olympic gold, he's won two Stanley Cups. Like, you know, he knows a winner when he sees it and he's not afraid to speak up when he's seeing a losing team and seeing, you know, losing behaviors, let's say, because that's, that's exactly what it was. And, you know, I, I will see. I mean, I think I, it's obvious. We, we don't, everybody's talking about Perry He's, he's, he doesn't look like he's checked in right now. And I, <laughs> I think that maybe the Jets dodged a massive bullet, right? I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but I just wonder if the Jets dodged a massive bullet and you look back and, this might be the trade that actually defines Kevin Cheveldayoff's legacy as a, as a GM for the Winnipeg Jets because not only did you change the entire complexion of like your team in terms of how yeah, I, to me it's a philosophical shift on on the depth of this team and 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 Kevin Cheveldayoff's talk about depth and dimension and that's what this team changed in that right they got a first line player they got a guy who can play first line to fourth line and they got Kapari who it's a bit of a reclamation project, let's say. Um, but, I mean, this team is completely different with these guys and completely, well, way better uh, than they were with, with, with Pierre Dubois. And now you fleeced, which, you know, you robbed Rob Blake, as, as, as the joke kind of goes. Um, and, and you're not having to deal with the, you know, the, the prospect of the next eight or seven and a half years of a guy who decides to show up some night and, and other nights doesn't decide to show up. So, yeah, I mean, this could be a – I mean, I, I don't think it's a far stretch to say this could be the the defining moment of, of Kevin Cheveldayoff's, you know, career as a GM, at least with the Jets. The fact that he turned in a guy who worked his way out of two cities 
and 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 then turned his team into a winner, you know, with a good amount of help from the guys that uh, that he got back from that trade. So we joked earlier Crazy. that uh, Rob Blake has Chevy blocked on all calls coming <laughs> forward. Right. I don't, considering I don't what's think happening. the trade deadline is, uh, yeah, I don't <laughs> think you'd be calling LA to try and try, try and get any more. But yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, okay. Before yeah. we go, who you got on the weekend? Oh, I mean, I mean, I want to. I want to say it's it's Baltimore, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I at some point, Lamar. I really don't want the Taylor Swift Super Bowl, but at the same time, I mean, it's hard to bet against. You're a hater. Lamar. You're a hater of Taylor Swift. Last. That's sad. Well, I just, sad. I just, I don't know. I mean, you're only a fan. No, because, don't, don't you believe in love? Don't team. you believe in love? <laughs> It's the greatest, uh, the greatest love story of the uh, 21st I, I, century. I, I guess, yeah, until the next one. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, Remo, in the back. I can hear that laugh. Anyways, but I mean, I, I just, I, they're so, I mean, Baltimore is really good. Like, I don't know if you're yeah, nervous. straight they like, are. Are you they're nervous? Like, you're you're the oh, Chiefs yeah. guy. Oh, yeah. Listen, like, I, don't, I don't expect they're just going to walk in and roll. How to I think it's going to be a super close right? game. I think yeah. much like the Bills games in the past in the playoffs, I think it's yeah. going to come down to the fourth quarter. And with the game Hopefully on the line, right. I'll trust yeah. Patrick Mahomes better than anyone. And and I and I, I think that's it, right? I mean, I think I'm at the point now where it's like, okay, well, this is where experience takes over for a guy like Mahomes, who has been to, what what is this, like the sixth straight AFC championship game? Something like that. Like every year he's been a starter, he's been, been in the AFC championship game. Um, and, and so, I mean, this is the thing, can Lamar, can Lamar, you know, I guess come in and, and, and put an end to that. I mean, this is, this is the, this is the big question this weekend and man, I mean, I'd love to see, I'd love to see a Chiefs Lions Super Bowl though. So let's, let's, oh, uh, no kidding. I, I really be... hope the Lions go. Oh, listen, I'm with you on and, the Lions. I think they but are. Then I'd be totally cheering for the Lions. And the only reason is because, So would everybody. Like, so would I know, everybody. Like, I mean, it's a, the Chiefs go from like like one of the more popular teams, right? Taylor Swift, Kelsey, obviously Mahomes, all that stuff. To I think the odds on underdog in terms of the public opinion, because everybody would just want to see this incredible Cinderella story or whatever you want to call it. Um, this massive turnaround since that 0 16 season, hey. whatever it was, 15 years ago. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think. I, I just I I think more than anything I want to see the Lions in the Super Bowl and then they can play whoever they want. Hey, listen before we go, uh, let's get Remo in here a minute. Uh, Remo, we got an interesting comment from uh, my uh, our, our discourse on Jacob Chikrin uh, yeah. when uh, when Scott and I talked last week. Oh, last week. Okay, yeah, yeah. you guys had a great chat last week about Jacob Chikrin. It did really well on our YouTube channel, and I guess people, you know, when we post videos, it's not the same people in the chat every day, right? But where is I gotta find this comment? Um, hold on. Oh yeah, here it is. Here's the comment from a from a, someone in our comment section. Shovel and rolled up carpet in his room. Should we be concerned about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not, not gonna say concerned. To that. It, yeah. it was it was pretty funny. Had a good That's laugh. That's a good comment. I, I, when, I never read the comment. Comments, but now I'm gonna have to read the comments. <laughs> yeah. That's a good shovel and rolled up carpet. Perfect. I never, yeah. I never put two and two together there. I'm like, yeah, it's just the shovel from Kenny and Randy. I'm, 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 see, this is the thing. This is the perfect crime, and I'm the perfect perp. So this is awesome. I like it. <laughs> this is awesome. I like going out on the that. internet, showing all of your tools of destruction, <laughs> right. in the, and they're just uh, right out in the, the open, background. right? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody would be like, "How did we not see this? How did we not see this? It was right there." <laughs> uh, Bill, great stuff, man. Uh, yeah. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the football games, and uh, maybe we'll see you down at the rink on Saturday. Yeah, have a good one, guys. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. There is Scott Billick of the Winnipeg Sun with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, all right. Uh, no, com- It takes a community to play segment uh, today, but we will get uh, probably do a couple next week. I'm um, looking forward to talking more about officiating. Now, not, you know, people ranging, uh, not people ranging on the, uh, on the referees in general, but we're going to have Travis Boyd, who is the Sport Manitoba Official of the Year in 2023, uh, and talk a lot about the challenges of getting officials into the mix and keeping them there. Um, you know, we often focus on, you know, some of the bigger team sports and more popular sports like hockey. 
uh, but there are real challenges at, on a number of levels uh, in amateur sport throughout. And uh, as we've said, without coaches, without officials, without volunteers, these games don't go on. Um, find out more on uh, the, what uh, sportmanitoba.ca. And as we talked yesterday, we didn't really touch on this today, uh, but you know, if you missed yesterday's program, kind of spoke with um, you know more followed from this 2018 Hockey Canada scandal in the World Junior Hockey Team which will certainly be back in the news very soon. A heck of a lot more, um, but it's important to uh, take note of all the safe sport programs for athletes and people involved at the game at all levels. It is important, and Sport Manitoba is doing a great job to promote that. And, of course, our next It Takes a Community to Play segment, uh, always supported by the gang at Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. All right, before we go and get this pod up, let's uh, check out the Cool Bet lines. Had a fun lock shop today. You know, we, we were talking about the cookie clip, Remus, and I'm interested. Dusty asked this to me in the lock shop. I'll ask it to you as well as everybody else. What is your go-to cookie? I mean, so, if you have the options of all sorts of cookies, what uh, what's number one for you? I'm just going straight chocolate chip. I don't. You can't go wrong with that. I no, don't. That's th- yeah. I'm not getting fancy. That's what I'm doing. Like, what am I like uh, when I go to some store? Yeah, that's that's what I'm gonna pick. There's like fancy, a, fancy ones now, but yeah, chocolate chip. There are. I'm. A, I'm. My favorite is the combination of peanut butter cookies and chocolate chip. Like a good peanut butter chocolate chip cookie might be my absolute favorite. One thing I know is that you're get, bringing a dozen and you're leaving it on the table, and people can grab whatever they want. Oatmeal raisin is going to be the last one to go. Yes, I mean I'll eat it, but um, not my first choice. Oh, Running Man, oatmeal raisin guy. Randy D, oatmeal CC, mic drop. Jano is definitely chocolate chip. Johnny Bender, Johnny Bender uh, uh, is with me. Peanut butter, chocolate chip, how can Look at all these oatmeal raisin people. And I'm not sure whether they're trolling us or these <laughs> sons of guns are going to get oh. it with this oatmeal raisin trash. <laughs> chocolate chip. Um, yes, I love how WST veers into fast food and gaming at a moment's notice. I'm, I'm saying, listen, I, I I don't mind them. Like, I will eat an oatmeal raisin cookie. Don't get me wrong. I mean, a cookie, it's like a pizza. Like, there's never really a bad pizza. But in the hierarchy or the power pole of cookies, I mean, I don't think there's too many people that have oatmeal raisin beating out the titans like chocolate chip, peanut butter cookies, and uh, and more. Low-key... Like, you know, a sneaky, sneaky good one that, you know, isn't as popular as the dream cookies. You get a good imperial cookie, that is uh, that is right up there. Anyways, we could talk about cookies for a while. You've seen us do it before. Let's get to uh, tonight's lines in the National Hockey League. And uh, a lot of games. Uh, Philly moving on with O'Carter Hart for the time being is in Detroit. They've lost three in a row. They've given up 18 goals in their last three games. They're a slight underdog at minus 103 to the Detroit Red Wings, who are at minus 114. Patrick Waugh and the Islanders in Montreal to take on the Habs. Islanders minus 142. Love the Islanders tonight. Um, Boston lost to Carolina last night. They're right back at it against Ottawa. It's probably why we're getting them in such a reasonable minus 132 number. Sends plus 112. Uh, Tampa's rolling. They've won 6-7. They're minus 224 at home against the Coyotes, who had quite the start to their game against the Panthers last night, if you saw that. A couple dukes, a couple fights right off the draw, or the first two draws. Uh, and then the Devils and the Hurricanes added Carolina coming off that big wing against Boston. They're back at home tonight, taking on New Jersey. Carolina's minus 165. And then some big, big mismatches or, well, Big lines. Dallas minus 328. The Wild are minus 118 favorites against the Preds. Preds at plus 101. Calgary minus 192 at home against the Blue Jackets. Get this, Remus. The Oilers, this is the biggest money line favorite I have ever seen in the National Hockey League. Minus 625. And the puck line at minus two and a half to win by three is at minus 118. This is probably the night, of course, that the streak ends. You know that by looking at this. My God, there's a couple um, big favorites recently that I'm like, yeah, they're going to smash. They're going to score so many goals. And they don't. And I think Vancouver has done that a couple times. 
to me lately. Edmonton, you know, they didn't like the way things were going us against Columbus. They fell, they slept through the first two periods, and they reunited McDavid with Dreisaitl in line with Hyman. They're going back to that tonight. So yeah, I'm expecting. You know, Chicago played yesterday against Seattle. They got smoked. I'm expecting that tonight, but hey, strange things happen yeah. here. So you know what? I, I can never be. I've learned over the years. You can never like nothing is guaranteed. No, that is uh, that is a fact. Uh, Flames. Uh, actually, this is down from minus two hundred earlier. They're minus one ninety two favorites against the Blue Jackets to round out tonight's games. And if we head over to the exclusives. Uh, we actually went with a four gamer tonight, um, Dusty and I. I mean, we really like the Red Wings and Islanders. Those are those are the picks that we started with, kind of reasonable odds, minus one fourteen, minus one forty two, and then we added Boston at minus one thirty two. Um, like we know Boston, what a good team they are. Lost last night. I, I'm not too rattled that they're playing the second end of back to backs. So we've got Boston in there, and then the Lightning against Arizona that played last night. We put that in just over seven to one, juiced it all the way up to plus 785. So that's there right now, the lock shop partner parlay. And then uh, all of the regulars in the lock shop chat threw in a couple of their favorite props for the nasty chat parlay. Uh, Sander, Jake Sanderson, two or more shots, dry sidle, a point, and yes, Jesper Bratt, three plus shots. That's at plus 235. So, uh, Want to jump in on that? You can get it in the Cool Bet exclusives. Otherwise, it's all there for you to make your own selections. And don't forget tomorrow at noon before Winnipeg Sports Talk over on the EST feed and YouTube channel, we will make our official picks for Conference Championship Sunday. Hit the totals and some of our favorite player props as well. And I will be getting into some Royal Rumble picks. Big line moves in the Royal Rumble, Reem. What? My guy Gunter. I was going to ride with Gunter in the men's Royal Rumble, and yesterday he was plus 600, and I was waiting to talk to the guys before we got into it. Uh, he's up. dropped from plus 600 to plus 185. You didn't I pull really, the trigger? I really missed the boat. No, Usually you're I, on top of that before I you know, get in I just, before. I, I didn't think that it was going to drop that way. So I was disappointed. Wow. CM Punk's the favorite. Can't stand that guy. Minus 110. And uh, Cody Rhodes plus two fifty. The Rock is at ten to one. He He's came back winning. to Raw a little while ago. Well, listen, he did come back to Raw a while ago and said that he was planning on sitting at the head of the table, which would mean a match with Roman Reigns. So, could there so, be a better way to set that up than The Rock coming back and winning the Royal Rumble? Someone's got to take out Roman Reigns. He's had the belt for way too long. He needs to lose, but. Like, if it's the Rocks, but then he just comes and leaves, so I don't think it makes sense for him to win. Like, it should have been Cody To win Rhodes, the title. No, It doesn't I agree. make sense for the Rock to win the title if he's not going to, if he's just going to go and do a movie or... Well, it's funny you bring that up because Reigns is a minus 2,500 favorite in the fatal four-way match with Randy Orton, AJ Styles, and LA Knight. So maybe... The Rock gets his Roman Reigns match, but he's already lost the title. I'm not sure. Probably uh, hard to stare down that minus 2,500 favorite, though. That's for sure. He's losing at WrestleMania, right? To Is, is it to Cody Rhodes again? Or I guess Everyone thought that, but now that CM Punk's there, although if Punk wins, he's probably going to go up against um, uh, Seth Rollins, although Seth Rollins is hurt now. So there's, there's a lot up in the air. And uh, your favorite, Logan Paul, He's defending the uh, United States Championship against Kevin Owens. He's a minus 1,000 favorite. KO is plus 500. And this is during the Jets-Leafs game on Saturday, right? It is. That's why I was hoping to PBR it. And Stupid Bell does not have the right things listed for WWE Network on Saturday. No. I'm hoping that changes. Otherwise, I hope at least it plays and I uh, record it properly. You want You want a little... Want an under the radar pick for the women's Royal Rumble? How about Jade Cargill at six to one? She has not yet competed in WWE. Superstar coming from AEW. They've been working on her. Um, I would say that she'll be ready to go very soon. And what better way to create a big superstar than have her debut and win the Royal Rumble? Bailey is the favorite. I don't know about that. Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks, but uh, I I'm looking at Jade Cargill at plus 600 
to get that done. It's all over there at Cool Bet. Again, join us tomorrow in the lock shop and use the promo code WST if you haven't played a Cool Bet before on your first deposit. And I'll hook you up with a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks just in time to ride with me on Patrick Mahomes on Championship Sunday. Um, Hacksaw is going to join us tomorrow. We will jump on over that. And speaking of Hacksaw, if you're with us right now at the end of the show live on YouTube, it's been a minute since we've had the opportunity to do a raid. Remus tells me that Hacksaw's show is live, so stay with us. We're going to do a little WST raid. Everyone pop over into the chat. Tell them that the Winnipeg Sports Talkers are showing up and say hi to Hacksaw and his gang, even if you're staying over for a couple of minutes. Um, thanks again to Brian Hayes. Great to have him on. Brandon and Scott, as always, and all of you for making us a part of your day. And, of course, to the sponsors that power Winnipeg Sports Talk 365 days a year. We'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Join me in the lock shop over at EST at noon. But right now, let's go si say hi to Hacksaw with the WST Raid right now. Have a great night, everybody. Oh, my oh! God. Oh! Shut it down. Oh let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at Winnipeg.